Hello, and welcome to the live stream. Uh, no intro this time, guys. This is not an official podcast. This is just an ask me anything. I don't have a prepared monologue, although I probably will go on several monologues. Uh, you know, If you want to chat with me or give me a question via the chat, which I probably will get to, but in a more limited way than in the usual uh, super chats or entropy chats, you can try to tag me with the at distributist thing. But I, I, I wanted to, you know, part, part of me doing this is just wanting to, to keep the pilot light alive in on this channel. I, I act like I never post here. I do post here. I love making videos. But for 2024, I... Essentially, I've come up with lots of different essay ideas, and every time I've had an essay idea, it's just made more sense for me to publish on Substack. And if I don't make a video recording of it, I can do two essays. And the, the essay is auto-read by the Substack AI, so if people want to listen to it, they can listen to it there. And it's uh, it's increasingly, and it also feels like a better reference because people there, there's more conversation on that platform. And this is, I, I, I kind of think to myself, well, you know, I'm, I'm mainly a YouTuber still. I always thought of myself mainly as a YouTuber or as a video essayist. And it's tragic that I'm stuck in this, in, in this turn on social media where essentially nobody is making new YouTube videos of any note. I mean, there's people who do it professionally. There's the podcast of the Lotus Eaters. There are a few video essayists, but I, I can't even really think of many video essayists that are still out there doing doing anything of note or, or worthwhile. I, I probably could talk about some people from the left who, who made video essays. I got my tea here tonight. This is going to be a very casual stream, so feel free to trickle in questions. No, Dave Green is not my real name. Green is a... Uh, Green is a reference to Graham Green and to the character of Fiddler's Green from the comic... Sandman, which was a stand-in for G.K. Chesterton, um, in reference to my original blog name, which was based on G.K. Chesterton. And, uh, you know, I was very interested in, in the whole Dominican theology and distributism. So there you go. Uh, I, my first name is Dave, so people always call me that, whatever you'd like. But I, I, I will take some time here to lament over the video essay. I, people just... I think it was just after I published my latest Substack, people kept on forwarding me uh, the, the latest ContraPoints video. <laughs> you, you have to watch, oh my God, Dave always responds to ContraPoints videos. And, and I usually have at least something to say about them. The last one they did a year ago, they, they make these videos once every year. Last video that ContraPoints made in 2023, it was about, it was a three hour retrospective on JK Rowling. And then this time we get a retrospective on Twilight. I just, I, I this is un, it's unwatchable. It is unwatchable content, as far as ContraPoints is concerned. This it, it's it's a rehash of Twilight was a big book when I was in college for teenage girls, and as most things did in the two thousands, it kept on cre creeping up. I don't know why I'm wearing headphones here. It kept on creeping up the age distinctions. It kept on being played to older and older audiences and pretty sh pretty soon adult women were reading twilight this is a, this is a 3 hour retrospective and it's it's just the same old feminist talking points that i heard about in my sophomore literature seminar that i needed to take to fulfill a humanities credit it was completely unwatchable uh, the other big release this year from from breadtube was the h bomber video guy on, on plagiarism which I mean, you know, I'm talking about a video that's just that's just out of its time. Uh, plagiarism in 2024. I mean, in the era of AI and from the community of people that consider themselves communists, now everyone is in breadtube is 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 just backbiting each other with recriminations, trying to figure out who plagiarized who, and of course these people. They all have opinions that are they're Xerox copies of each other's opinions. They all read the same books. They all they all like the same young adult fiction novels. They they all have the same uh, freshman diversity seminar talking points. So I mean, trying to figure out who's plagiarizing who is 
It's, it's like handing out speeding tickets in the Indy 500, even if we were in an age where plagiarism made sense. This is the whole problem with the whole Claudine Gay thing, which, you know, the Claudine Gay thing is a legitimate case of plagiarism because it's an academic environment, which, you know, in video environments and in documentary filmmaking, oftentimes it's very, very easy to clip people out of context. It's very, I mean, I don't think it's very easy. I don't think I've ever done anything like the examples that were in, in those circumstances, but I can, I can remember using a certain phrase or a certain saying or a certain sentence that I'm pretty sure I heard somewhere else. It's not plagiarism. <laughs> you know, there, there are a few things that Aaron McIntyre is famous for saying that I'm like, I'm pretty sure came from something that I thought of in a podcast in 2018. Who cares? It's fine. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We're all reading the same novels or not really novels, but yeah, novels too. We're all reading the same novels and, and literature and, and, pieces of Italian elite theory and, and Sam Francis and Burnham and uh, all that good stuff. There, there's going to be some overlap, but of course, leave it to the communists. They're, they're going to go on a three-month witch hunt for who were the real plagiarists. And, and of course, the, the the absolutely original philosophy tube did did a uh, did a three uh, did like a two hour uh, you know because every single thing philosophy philosophy tube is just the most mindless chaser of trends. Every single video is just let's use ContraPoint style to talk about whatever is big this month and then put a bunch of bibliographies in about philosophers. And this is what this person said. This is what that person said. I mean, the, the amount of originality is is kind of astonishingly bad. I mean, it's astonishingly bad. And, and they have writers. These people we, we don't understand is that in for these big YouTube channels, they, they originally wrote their own stuff, but they, they have writers. And I always remember this... Um, this uh, this this woman leftist blogger, kind of like Lindsay Ellis from the original Nostalgia Ch uh, Check channel, or that guy with the glasses back in the day. By the way, guys, is my sound all right? People said last time it was too low. But anyway, this this woman Sarah Z, she's just it's kind of this insufferable stereotype of a millennial woman. She sits on a couch with 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 like this very very prominently displayed teacup, which she holds right up next to her her mouth and, and never actually drinks. And then she just dishes about about whatever trend in literature or whatever th she thinks is problematic about usually young adult fiction or or something that's sort of in the Marvel movies here, like nothing that's very very highbrow. And, and she doesn't. Really Really have opinions like you couldn't you couldn't take her ideas and summarize them in, in some encapsulated form she kind of has opinions like people have brain aneurysms or or, or people have a case of the hiccups she just experiences them and you're, you're in you're in this uh very organic moment of just this chatter piling out of this woman's mouth and then half half halfway through the, the video I saw of hers this year, <laughs> it was, I wonder what's going on, on on the left side of YouTube. Let's let's watch Dave's channel. Half Halfway through, this woman's rendition, expression, uh, uh, performative dance of the feeling she's having about various young adult novels, she mentions how the writer of her show is a trans woman, the, apparently to get brownie points. I think to myself, the, the writer of your show, this is just incoherent effeminate ramblings you, you had to like you had to subcontract this out you had to outsource this to the trans woman <laughs> some trans woman on a discord server is 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 just is coming up with catty catty pseudo discourse pseudo philosophical discourse so that this like aging millennial woman can prattle it out while sitting on her sofa and a, and a cup of tea in her hands um i mean it's, it's tragic to see how how the mighty you and this this used to be the, the YouTube used to be a platform for discourse. <laughs> I, I said this every single episode on Fedler's Green podcast. YouTube used to be a platform for discourse, and I, I like interviewing people. The problem is I'm not a very good interviewer. Uh, I, I I either I'm too aggressive or or I'm too uh, standoffish. I don't do it very well, and right now. We have some of the best interviewers uh, on the internet, I would say. We have Jay Burden, we have Benjamin Boyce, we have Alex Kashuda. And if you're looking for the more professional side, there's obviously the, the Lotus Eater guys for more of the studio experience. But also, I mean, I don't know, I think they have some long form stuff behind paywalls. But, uh, you know, as um, 
I, I'm more used to like the bite size stuff coming out of them because I'm I'm just sitting on the the non paywall side of their feed. But it, we have some of the best interviewers in in the internet, and I'm really bad at it. What I, what I do think I'm not necessarily really good at, but what I do very much enjoy is a contentious discussion where I can see both sides struggling with some issue and, and the, the wills clashing. And that that's just that is completely dead in in modern in 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 the modern post 2022 or post 2021 world. Uh, the, the platform is essentially a series of echo chambers, a series of echo chambers. Um, I still watch the last, I don't, I don't really watch, like I click on it, watch a few minutes and then click off because it's impossible to listen to. I, I, I don't know how any heterosexual, warm-blooded man with a normal T level could make it all the way through that ContraPoints video with their sanity intact. I mean, it's, it's, it's blather. Every single idea is an idea that you would have probably encountered from some literature seminar when the teacher smuggled in Twilight as, as one of the books under discussion uh, onto the list of a book that should have ordinarily contained actual literature. Or if you were, you know, if you went to university later than I did, it probably would have just been on the curriculum straight up. And it's like, oh my God. Did you know heterosexual sex has a dimension of violence to it? Women like a certain amount of assertiveness and violence in their in their sexual encounters. And this is what Stephanie Meyer is attracted to. Yeah, I've heard that for 10 years. I mean, every, every sort of woman who had a comparative literature degree did an exposition on this over an IPA in 2005 to 2009. And, and every single person who were, this book was discussed, that was the only interesting thing to discuss about that book and the, the various feminist explanations for why it's not actually a problem. Uh, and But, you know, the, ContraPoints is just this drugged out version of, of a comparative literature class from 2009 uh, with with costumes and, and wallpaper, and that's the channel. It, it's 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 an atrocious. I, mean, I guess it's better than H Bomber guy. I, I kind of almost felt that that whole plagiarism video was almost kind of disgusting. It was it was essentially internet drama and tattletaling, hyped up on uh, being sold to me as some kind of like art. Uh, this this is this is the video of the year. One guy going on a witch hunt for plagiarism. This is the video. This is what the platform is supposed to deliver. Not a discussion of the economy. Not a discussion of the culture. Not an exploration of technology and its implications for our species. It's plagiarism. It's plagiarism. It's the eternal plagiarism witch hunt. It's drama. And you know, I, I, people push back on me. I'll go, oh, you, you called Libs of TikTok a tattletale. And she's done more for the right wing than anyone else has previously. And I do admit Chaya Radchick's done a lot of things for the conservative, the right wing movement. It's incredibly useful stuff. But but it's also really kind of like, I'm, I'm glad a woman is doing this. I'll just say this. I, I mean, it's, it's also so catty. It's so it's such a catty practice to go to people's bios and go, oh, did you know who's doing this? Oh, do you know who's doing this? It's like like little like here's here's the list of people who were naughty in class while the teacher was away, and in in an, an ordinary healthy society we would have a procedure of self policing and a standard for behavior, but I, I can't read Jaya Radchik's channel because a it's depressing, but b because it just, it just feels like I'm I I mean I, I feel like I'm seeing sort of the the dark mirror inversion of what the 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 sort of like the racism. Does anyone remember that from the Gamergate era? There was this guy who had an account called the Racism Watchdog, and so if you posted something that he thought was racist or sexist, he just retweet it with the dog going woof woof woof, and it'd be like the dog is is woofing at you for for having this incorrect opinion. A lot of the libs of TikTok, well well invaluable to make parents aware of what's actually going on in public schools. As far as content for people who are actually already on the right wing, it's 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 pretty low quality and it kind of feels a little dirty to be straight up. I just don't really like that that kind of stuff. You know, it's it's a, it's a necessary evil, I guess. And it's certainly not something 
that that men should be principally concerned with. So, I mean, to get like a two hour video on plagiarism, I mean, now there's like this big drama that <laughs> the left has finally completely become the Ouroboros that it always wanted to be, where H Bomber guy is getting pushback because one of the people he made the plagiarism video about may have well, deleted their channel and may have self harmed in some serious way, which I think is probably unlikely, but that's the big, that's the big drama. Oh my God, H Bomber guy, he's got a kill count of one. Um, I, re I really doubt it. If the guy had killed himself, we would have heard about it in, in a week's time. So I'm I, I'm pressing X a doubt on that. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, the thing. Oh, oh, I forgot. I forgot. Since everything old is new again, the big news story this this week, this I think it's this week everyone's talking about, like Gamergate 2. Uh, Gamergate 2. Uh, I, 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 I saw this. <laughs> um uh, yeah, there's not going to be a Gamergate 2. So I, I suppose that Gamergate 2 is triggered by the discovery of this consulting firm called, what was it, Sweet Sweet Baby? Uh, Sweet, uh, well, what is the consulting firm? I have this up here. Uh, this is an informal stream because I can totally do this. It's it's Sweet Baby, right? It's not Sugar Baby. Sugar Baby would be too much on the nose, right? It, it's it's sweet, sweet Baby, right? Oh, well, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it is Sweet Baby. So it's Sweet Baby Incorporated is this consulting firm where they, they, they essentially consult video games to make sure that their scripts are in alignment with DEI principles. They don't call it that, right? Because this is what they always do, right? D the left will always reject any word you have for their ideas or their thought patterns because it kind of destroys the KFOB if, if everyone realizes that they're in line, speaking from a certain ideology, they it, leftism only feels fresh if 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 the pretense can be provided that they all just woke up and thought of this stuff spontaneously. You know, like in the two thousand and nine to two thousand and twelve uh, flip over, right? That everyone saw, but nobody, no one says actually occurred. In 2009, everyone was just, we want to be reasonable about race, we want to be fair, equality of consideration. It's all about systematic reform and getting better laws, blah, 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 blah. In 2012, it's 100% privilege plus power equals racism. White people, you can't be racist against white people. Full court press on, on rape culture, which is everything and anything that feminists don't like in any given moment. It, completely incoherent standards of sexual engagement. From from a supposedly sex positive community, and I hate that word sex positive, but you know, it, it, the everyone saw it. You can literally see it in graphs from LexisNexis concerning the words that say the New York Tar Times or the San Francisco Chronicle or or the LA Times use. The word counts show this language skyrocketing up in 2012, but but no one will admit. Oh yeah, we all got on board with a new ideology in 2012. That doesn't happen, right? But Sweet Baby is the, the newest consulting firm for video games. And it was discovered that they indeed influenced a lot of AAA video game manufacturers. I mean, uh, we didn't know that was happening already. I mean, this is, this is why there's, I mean, everyone, and of course, uh, since everyone on YouTube right now is essential, I mean, everyone who's big on YouTube, because YouTube doesn't create big people anymore, it just, just kind of, ha ha this kind of houses a lot of us old old guys from from the early days. All of the all the people like short short fat Ataku and Adam and Sitch, or I'm not so sure about Adam and Sitch, but short fat Ataku and, and Sargon and and uh, Carl Benjamin and and all of these class of people they jumped right back on the gamer game bandwagon. It's it, everything old is new. Uh, this can't occur. Everyone knows. I mean, the the, the reason why GamerGate was so impactful. Was it was it was a, a group of people that the left wing thought it had loyal to itself, breaking from the coalition when the ideological change got put in. In all of their other avenues, all of the other avenues that the left controlled in terms of culture were entirely female dominated, and as such, they responded to a certain level of female agreeableness. So when the new language I was talking about was introduced around 2012 that signaled the more radical break, all of those organizations just got straight on board and the change went off without a hitch. 
And so all throughout 2012, 2013, leading into 2014, it was castle after castle just fell in line because it was essentially an entirely female-dominated space. Hence also why feminism was such a big deal. They go to video games and, whoa, guess where all of the men have been for the last 10 years? Well, not actually wielding power in any meaningful way in the real world. They've all been culturally spending their energy on video games. And all of a sudden, there's a big fight because the regular tricks that the left likes pulling in environments of highly agreeable people don't work anymore. And so nerd culture itself begins to completely fracture and fray around the edges. And it's never the same since. You know, from there on, uh, going on to Me Too, going on to essentially 2020 with the eventual defeat of Trump or Trump number one, I should say, it's just a series of cancellations, cancellations, cancellations in which the mainstream cultural apparatus essentially, I mean, it literally castrates itself to the point where it's a complete echo of itself in the modern day. But the thing is, is that we, after 2020, we, we know where these organizations stand we, we, we know where these organizations, where, where their bread is buttered, how they behave. So there, there can't be any surprise. Did anyone not think that these classic Gamergate-type individuals weren't acting as paid consultants for AAA corporations? It's illegal not to have these kind of consultants if you're, if you're a large corporation making media. Because a lawsuit concerning disparate impact or concerning a hostile work environment com could completely destroy you. So it's, it's no secret. And furthermore, this is also something, is that there was kind of a test that was put about, you know, it, what made Gamergate scarier for the left and, and why the, the original incidents of, of what we call the alt-right now, which is now a completely defunct movement, what made it so scary for the left was that it wasn't apparent exact. So this group of people, this very, very large group of young, white and Asian, but mostly white men, you know, <laughs> white and white adjacent men, start breaking off from the cathedral mainstream and start going right. And in this process, in 2016, 2017, 2018, it's not exactly clear how far right they could even go. Could could they just completely leave the boomer truth regime? And uh, I mean, the, the the answer is yes or no. Yes and no. A huge number of young men, including myself, <laughs> although you know I was kind of you know I was uh, I was I was kind of more pushing in this direction rather than getting pulled. But you know. I, a lot of young men have ended up eventually completely leaving behind the mainstream 20th century boomer truth regime. What didn't happen and what was, I think, you know, what I think 2020 and the subsequent years what was a great success of the left is that the, the a vast majority of the people that were involved in the original Gamergate type thing, the 2016 energy, a lot of them did not go all the way because it was just too hard. The ideas were too socially unacceptable. The consequences for being publicly known as a thought criminal were were very, very severe. And the the cathedral, the the the, the establishment made several very prominent examples of people and how it was going to punish them. And the thing is, it, it became less fun to to just to to get into the environment because in in uh, in, in the original two thousand and fourteen, you know, there was a the 14 to 2018 era of this thing. Your channel could just grow indefinitely. People could make entire careers by doing this and just by talking about their own opinions. They didn't have to mean right now people bust their ass on Substack to come up with an original idea or writing that sounds particularly good or or just having a, a, a very, very consistent way of reporting on the news. And we have a lot of talented people. We have a lot of people that are, are very, very are good at writing and, and have a certain amount of insight. And really, if you're a person like myself or Carl, who survived since 2016, professional or not, there, there's something you have that you're giving to people. But, but in 2015, like anybody could just be a disembodied head basically doing react content and they would become popular and then they, then they would get more popular just as a personality in it of themselves the 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 the, pol the political channels were were essentially popular personalities themselves 
And what what happens in this was was it, it appeared to be kind of like a runaway reaction. Yeah, and you can see this in left left wing too. Like for instance, Hassan Piker, the guy is a talentless hap, hack. The guy is a talentless hack or a Vosh, absolute degenerate person. Uh, it was, was revealed recently. Absolutely degenerate person. Uh, no one should be listening to him. His one advantage is that he has a very very good voice and a good ability to stay on topic and in inside a conversation. And he's quick on his feet. Uh, but but you know no one would ordinarily listen to him. But they they those channels are allowed to continue algorithmically. The pattern that most of the right wing or Gamergate channels were doing in 2015, 2016, 2017, which is growing indefinitely and being popular just by being popular, forcing the conversation. Because since your video went viral, everyone's talking about it and everyone's reacting to it. And the React people need to have React content. So, but this more or less, at least until Elon got in charge of Twitter, was completely curtailed for the right side of things. Not least of which because their AI algorithms were triggering on every single word that right-wingers ordinarily like to talk about. So, you know, this eventually was shut down. And it struck me for, for a while about all of this stuff is it, it, it has felt to a large degree like the right wing is, it's missing a lot of people. I mean, it's missing a certain kind of person. There is a, a uh, you know, you, you watch these leftist channels and, um, you know, I, I, there's one that's, kind of, they're, they're all really degenerate people. They're all people who are very harmed, I should say. They're all people who are, I feel kind of sorry for. But I, I was I was looking at one called Let's Talk About Stuff. And this person, again, trans person, uh, doing horrible harm to themselves with drugs and, and what looks like a really unhealthy lifestyle. They look, they're suffering from multiple mental illnesses. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of looking at this person and I'm, I'm saying like, well, well, in a healthy society, what would you be? Well, this person would be a person who would just be an ordinary community member. Uh, they want to be in a nice, safe little hug box. They want to talk about their favorite art. They want to get the applause for talking about their favorite art. Uh, they want to kind of go with the crowd and and, and be in the center of things and be accepted. Uh, in, in certain, and, and they're also very artsy in, in a weird sort of way, very artsy and crafty kind of thing. And, and, on the right, we have a lot of very big personalities. We have a lot of talent, but there's not, you know, there, there's at least four or five pieces of fiction I have from creators that I have sitting on my to read pile next to my bed. And I have, unless the publish, unless I'm obligated to write a review, it's very hard to read uh, because I, I just don't have the time to read fiction. And I'm thinking to myself, where are all the people who just like reading fantasy so that they can live in a fantasy world? That's not my mind at this point in my life. I'm, I want to read fantasy. I want to kind of have a little bit of an escape too. But but my brain is totally consumed with, with history and, and this world. And and uh, whenever I have a live stream like that, like this isn't a chill. I mean, okay, maybe this is a chill for you guys. And it is a little chill. All live streams have a chill atmosphere to them to a certain degree. But but this isn't this isn't kind of most people would not consider a distributed live stream to be a chill place. <laughs> it, it's a, it's very intense. I talk about a lot of different ideas, and it's very dynamic because that's how my brain moves. Uh, th there's not really you know when I think of someone like Isaac Young, uh, who's in all of this fiction. He's a young guy coming up in our community. He's most famous now for doing the whole Starship Troopers thread, and now the left's totally angry at him. Uh, you know, he 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 has a lot a very dynamic personality. He is exactly the kind of person that that sh that kind of these these weird degenerate leftists who just want to be in a hug box should be reading. I mean, they shouldn't obviously be taking drugs and developing mental disorders and uh, you know cutting off their genitals. Uh, but but these personalities are going to read someone else's work and geek out over it and. The, the schlock that comes out of Marvel movies and crap like Homestuck and modern comics is it, it's spiritual poison to borrow an expression of someone I used to know. And, and 
it, it feels in many ways, and this is what it was why Gamergate can't happen again. Is is very permanently two sides of humanity were cut in two, like the Skeksis and the Mystics from the Dark Crystal, and uh, you, you can't do that again. You can't fracture this again. All the scandal is going to do involving Sweet Baby is going to remind people that it's um that the other side still exists. I think I had a, a window going here. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Ever ever since the um ever since the, the Vosh thing, I'm like ever streamer is thinking. Oh, I wonder what's the most degenerate thing that could, that could that, that that people could find if 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 my tax folder was open. I don't think there's anything on my computer <laughs> that would possibly be scandalous, right? I don't know. <laughs> um. But but uh. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> here, here's our friend Juniper Tree, uh, you know, an artist, reminding me that uh, art can sometimes be very, very racy. But one thing I wanted to, you know, like the, the biggest thing to come out of, that's not racy, by the way, but I know Juniper Tree does have some more racier fare that, that is out for people who, who might be, um, which is appropriately, uh, uh, appropriately um, done by a woman. <laughs> Although, I mean, men can do it too. Uh, yeah, so I, this is this is the thing that I remember coming from Gamergate too. It's it's the, it's the picture of <laughs> this is the symbol of the pro. If I were to come up with a picture for where Gamergate ended, there was a retrospective that was published on Substack from Lake of Lerna about Gamergate, and I thought it was very good for the most part, but. It, it kind of really cut into. I think it really was unfair to people like Sargon and uh, Shuan Head. Uh, the the you know Sargon or, or sorry, Carl Benjamin right that they the the Lake of Lerna was very I thought I thought it was very unfair to them because they wanted to portray it like oh there's problems on both sides and it tried to prepare it tried to present uh, Sargon as well it tried to present Shuan Head as a airhead and it tried to present Sargon as kind of a um, an unserious person who is a little bit of a degenerate on the side, despite his conservative pretensions, which is not not my impression. I, Carl Benjamin is a father and a family man, and he might have had a, a past that was different than that. Uh, but you know, the, the, I thought the author was very, very unfair of his characterization, especially since uh, since then Carl Benjamin has expanded his family and has done all this community building and has really come a long way ideologically. Uh, but 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 one and I also. Unfair on Shuan Head. I mean, like, Shuan Head is agreeable and always adopts the political opinions of the people who are closest to her in an interpersonal way. AKA Shuan Head is guilty of being a woman. I'm sorry, right? That's 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 what the great fault of Shuan Head is. Uh, that's not being an airhead. That's called being a woman. Women are very agreeable, and they always go with the strongest person in the room who has a tight interpersonal relationship to them. And they always look to agree with that, but the, um, the 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 picture that will forever characterize the end of Gamergate will be this one that came across my feed. Apparently, it's from a few months ago, where Anita Sarkeesian had a birthday party that was wedding themed. <laughs> so, uh, as a fortieth birthday, uh, a forty uh, the forty year old the the forty year birthday party, it was a wedding to herself with all her guests or at least the male guests dressed as grooms, some as divorce lawyers and drunk un uncles and a ring bear. Um, <laughs> it's just, I mean, it, it, it's symbolic of where, I mean, it's just, it's, it's such, it's such a symbolic dead end of, of where, where this eventually left people. It, it, what you so see, you've conquered. So let's say you've conquered video games. What have you conquered? You haven't conquered, uh, you haven't created a portal into people's souls or people's passions. All you've done is cut off that entire avenue of life to yourself. You cut off men and you end up having 40, 40 year birthday parties. Uh, what do you call them? 40 year old birthday parties. That sounds weird. You end up having 40 year old birthday parties where you're, pre you're pretend marrying your, your non-significant others. Uh, the, 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 what, what happens when you cut off a dimension of the other side is that you don't, you don't, you're not necessarily liberated. You're just stuck with half of the thing, an incomplete thing that cannot fulfill its, its, its potential. Uh, 
you know, the, the feminist that cuts off men from her life, they don't become independent Nichan entities that that are just that are just creating their own worlds out of nothingness uh, from their pure wills. Uh, what what do they do for the most part? They relive the same feminine patterns that are organized around men and children with different objects that are just flat out less interesting, less poetic, less artistic, and less fertile. <laughs> and, and this is the end of Gamergate, at least from the other side. You know, I'll say this, that the, the, the side that won, Gamergate was the side that went on and had families and, and grew up. You know, I, I was posting this um, the other day, or you know, another person I remember from, very prominently from the pre-Gamergate era, I don't know whether it's not a good way to show profiles here. Um, yeah, I mean, do, do you remember Seth Rogen from, from Knocked Up? And do you remember this guy from, the, the, uh, this character was... Someone who I remember from throughout my entire life as an older millennial, and and well, as an older millennial, although I think Seth Seth Rogen I think is more on the Gen X side, like Daria. I remember him from Freaks and Geeks. I remember him from Knocked Up. I remember him from all of those Jed Apatow movies. I, I remember him from Green Hornet, even that uh, Michelle Gondry movie that was god awful. Um. And he was likable in those movies. He was likable in those movies. At least initially. Right? Because initially, with, with, with Seth Rogen, the, the idea... Uh, every movie was the same, right? Every movie, he was the man-child. Uh, every, every movie, he was the man-child. And uh, he, 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 through the course of... Through, through the arc of the movie, through the arc of the narrative, he would realize that he needed to become a man. He needed to put the video game controllers down and the pot down and actually take responsibility for someone else's life. Uh, marry somebody. And Knocked Up is the perfect example of that, right? He gets a woman pregnant. He decides to do the right thing. Gets a shit job as a computer programmer. And then maybe the marriage doesn't work out, <laughs> as it's implied. But at least he stops becoming a man-child. Uh, the real Seth Rogen is in 2024 selling people pot accessories, pot accessories, and bragging about not having children, bragging about being a childless 40 year old. This guy looks old. <laughs> he looks old, and you, you can't help but but think that to yourself when you see him, you did not make the spiritual transformation that all of your characters did in the movies. It's a complete lie. I mean, what, didn't you not internalize the message of those movies? What was the point of them? What was the point of Knocked Up other than to not be the, per, the person you've become? It's even worse because in all of those movies where Seth Rogen grows out of the man-child role, he's not a filthy fucking rich actor. In this world, he is a filthy rich actor, and he still can't grow up. He, kill, he still can't re take responsibility. He's still here at, in his 40s. Looking like he's 50, I will add, tr trying to sell uh, 40, uh, 30 and 40 year old millennials more marijuana, which, good lord, do we need anything more than more drugs in our life, more ability to tap out of reality as it is? That, that's exactly what we need. But, I mean, th th this is the end of Gamergate, right? This is what the other side, th th in case you're worried, if you're, in case you're wondering about what the blue pill looked like. Where you thought you picked the wrong side. Uh, this is where it leads. And I mean, I think, you know, I, I can't get angry at these people because they just, they don't want to fight. And you know, it very, very much so the, the space where I am in always talks about doing things in real life, moving forward. What can we learn from building a counter lead, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do we improve the right wing art scene? Uh, the... That that's hard. It's not fun. It's not. It's not. And, and even for people who who didn't take the hard blue pill, and who didn't go full trans, and still have the semblance of normality in their lives, and didn't completely drink the left wing Kool Aid. I'm thinking here really specifically of people like Short Fat Otaku or Dev. I mean, uh, I mean they're still kind of in this mode, right? They're still kind of in this this modern consumer mode. And, and, and it, frustrates, it frustrates me to see this. It, it does because that's not where... I mean, obviously, I'm 
speaking to you on YouTube, <laughs> sort of a dead platform uh, in, in some ways, more than a few ways. And it's not, it, it, it's, it, you know, it is kind of a, it is kind of a, a carryover from, from more innocent time. But the, the whole point of this is to, is to move beyond and to move out of it. And, you know, okay, let's, let's do a rehash of Gamergate, guys. It, 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 we're returning, we're not even returning to the 90s anymore. We're just, we're just returning to 2014. Was 2014 really all that great? I don't remember 2014 being all that great. You know, I, I, I really don't. Anyway, um, <laughs> you'll see the scandal that is my Twitter account. Oh, here's more wonderful art from Juniper Tree. This is something I think, you know, I, I didn't intend to show it, but by by all means, I my wife and I purchased one of her originals. It's very, very nice. And I do think there's there's a large space. I mean, there I don't think. I know there is a large space coming on from uh, from from art scenes that are emerging through multiple dimensions. There's obviously the passage press. There, there's scenes here in New York. There's apparently a scene growing in California and then Seattle. And so I'm really encouraged by all of this. And the left, it's kind of funny. The left's not doing anything. They have so many people. They have so many creatives that are there out of, out of, out of habit. But they're not producing anything worthwhile or that that's notable. It's kind of funny because every now and again, you you, you you know, on Substack too, I was perusing my feed and I came across. I think Library of Solana found this person. It's in, the the blog's entitled something like everyone's entitled to my opinion, and it's just it's, it's it, there's there's this whole network of of Trump derangement syndrome blogs, and they pull in like ten times the traffic of even the top end of your typical artsy or intellectual right-wing blog. And all they do is sit around and bitch about Trump and 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 swear at each other like they're uh, like they're teenage girls. It's a, and it's it's all populated by like this weird combination of older millennial women and hysterical boomers who are spurking out because they think that Trump is somehow the reason why no one believes in the truth, uh, the boomer truth regime anymore. And, and they're trying to kind of cathartically strike back at the ba bad orange man. And these people, and I, I came across another guy that I remember from the Gamergate era called Raging Monkey or Ranting Monkey or something like that. Like he just, he just reads the news and complains about the SJWs for, I mean, he's been, and this is, you know, I watched him back in 2017. He started his channel at the same time as I did. And it's the same show every every day. It doesn't, it doesn't iterate. There's not like a development of ideas. There's not like a, a series of authors we're reading or, or, or plans for community building or a plan to reach out to the larger conservative movement or organizing conferences or trying to advance artists. It's just, it's just the stasis. The entertainment product just chugs along. And... I mean, an enormous amount of people in our generation are just stuck in these places. It's it's kind of amazing. I don't know. I, I guess it's uh, it's really what, true what they say about learned helplessness. Okay, guys, I know people added me. I'm going to start reading the chat. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do one entropy chat. Then I'll probably try to go back and do a one from one one freebie randomly selected. Um. Here is the first one. So will Acolyte for $10. Molyneux is on Locals. He has evolved since deplatforming. He is, hasn't converted, but he's been to church now and admits Christian values are often better than secular ones. I'm a better person after his streams. Interested in your thoughts. I think you are two of the smartest people on the internet. Well, I certainly wish Stephen Molyneux well, because he was one of the first people who did this stuff, this kind of live stream stuff that we're doing right now. I won't lie. I was never really a big fan of his while he was on YouTube. And I don't think he handled his deplatforming very well back when it happened in 2020. He kind of gave the cathedral what it wanted, which was, oh my God, they've destroyed me. You know, that kind of thing. But I'm really glad to hear that he's bounced back. And what always struck me about Stephen Molyneux is that he was a very high agency person. 
even that's kind of a high agency. That's a buzzword from 2019, and it's heavily overused. But it's um, it, it's something I always associate with Stephen Molyneux, where I, I feel is like well, he's always going to be doing something that's interesting, and he's always going to land on his feet. So it's good to kind of make sure he, he, he keep an eye on him, see what he's up to, right? I mean, to, to be quite honest, um, you know, about all of this stuff here, we have a lot of talent. It's just, the question is, when in, in the Gamergate era, it was just so clear what everyone needed to be doing. It was all about building up a huge mob on social media and then using that mob acutely to get your way in, in some meaningful way expression or to trigger a reaction and get more people to listen to your side this avenue is more or less closed because the entire media apparatus is shut down nobody is dialoguing with each other because no one feels like they have to dialogue with each other and uh, you know this 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 cra- this lockdown is it, it forces us to think in new and original ways about what we want to be as a community what we want to have by the end of 2024, I mean that there, you've got one year, you've got eight months. After November, this country is going to be a different place. Either Trump will be reelected, in, which I think is probably the, the least likely of the two outcomes. Uh, the and, and we'll have another huge ruckus, you know, another huge repeat of the whole hysteria that racked the nation in 2016 which, you know, I'm not particularly looking forward to repeats, but maybe something will come out of it this time. Or conversely, I think more likely, the the establishment, the government will keep Trump out some way. And if that way looks really, really bad, there'll be a legitimacy crisis, which I think, in fact, will accelerate things faster than they would have otherwise. I mean, and then the big, the big elephant in the room in all of this is just the boomer generation, I, nothing can proceed while the boomer generation is here, just sitting on the status quo, repeat status quo indefinitely button. They're the reason why more conservative resources aren't flowing in the direction of the distant sphere, which is the only future the right wing has because it's the truth. <laughs> They're the reason why the left wing is constantly in the mode of just being an entertainment product. The, the the boomers are the elephant in the room, and until they completely leave the scene or change, everything is going to be kind of in a pattern where 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 we're building behind the scenes, but very much the the narrative of society overall is static because it can't move because the boomers are just so big demographically. I'll check back here. Um, blah 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 blah. Um. Okay, uh, do you think we're in the fourth turning, perchance? Um, I'm not so sure if I really believe in the, 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 the generational theory, the four-generational theory. Was it the Strauss-Howe generation theory? I think there's some truth to it, and, and the same thing that all human patterns are cyclical. Uh, but but the, the, the crises that, are, that define each generation are so radically different from one generation to another for instance i mean technically the millennials are are the same generation as the generation that fought world war ii but like in 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 the in the sort of fourth turning model right but the political crisis of legitimacy that the west is having right now is nothing like the second world war in any way shape or form so these analogies are kind of helpful but they're not they're not too legitimate right um, any other interesting questions? Uh, a millennial booktube, uh, blah, blah, blah. How do we cope with living around deracinated people versus various nations of people? I mean, deracination is going to be the order of the day. We can, we can build communities of culture, which is what I think, that's what basket weaving is designed to do. And there's been a lot of successes in that. I'm, I, I'm kind of, you know, I, I think we need to get the organization apparatus a little bit more formalized uh, because what we have right now is such a nice machine, at least for where it's working, right? It's like that famous um, 
It's like that famous uh, line from Anchorman. 60% of the time, it works 100% of the time. I say, like, basket weaving is going strong. And people are like, well, there's no basket weaving where I live. Well, I, I don't know what to tell you, right? Like, I, you know, be the first person because it's, it's strong where it is strong. But be, being a hub for, rat, for, for, for culture is one of the avenues that basket weaving can do. Uh, and, you know, reaching out to people like, for instance, na a natural ally of the right wing are, is the classical music community or classical music radio. We don't control that. The progressives control that. The progressives know in their heart of hearts that they shouldn't control that. And ev I guarantee what's going on right now is, and I don't really, I haven't looked at what the college radio scene has been doing since college, but, but no, seeing how other institutions like this work, like classics departments, oh, I know what's going on in, in, in classical music radio these, this day and age. What's going on in classical music radio, insofar as it still exists, is that their leadership apparatus is constantly toying with doing certain things that would completely destroy the community. Because we all know that classical music was written by a bunch of racist, straight, dead white men. And there's just not going to be, I mean, maybe in 200 years when there's new civilization, that will change. But right now, so right now with us in a cultural low point of production, uh, in, in a major way, there aren't going to be major composers that will supplant these people in any meaningful sense. Um, so, yeah, that that's interesting. My, my video is a little bit uh, spaced out. I hope this is not, you're not seeing anything. But I mean, like, you know, reaching out to that would be a great task. And you, if you are feeling deracinated, obviously the first step is to reconnect with your spirituality. But the next step, I think, is to is to go out and, and actually experience culture. And it usually is pretty cheap. Classical music is a little expensive these days because so few people perform it. But it used to be you could get it for, for, quite, a, for quite affordable prices. You know, and it's fun. It feels, it feels cultural. You know, from from my last uh, trip out with my wife, where we uh, have to say goodbye to a significant amount of our income for babysitting, we went out and saw a high school musical, which was which was that uh, horrible. Um, I mean, it was a great production; the kids did great, but it was that horrible um, a musical called Chorus Line, which it, of all the bad things, it, it's a musical about musicals. Which I mean, it's just how how theater already had to deal with high school drama kids, but now it's a high school drama kids being in a musical where they play other people being in a musical, talking about issues that really only people who are in the showbiz have to worry about. So so it's this, it's this complete like narcissistic self referential, and it has one good musical number in it, but but that is that that is what it is, right? All right, time for an entropy chat. Next one. Blue State Reactionary for $10. Hi, Dave. Do you think that our current demographics in the U.S. are baked into the cake? Some of our circles talk about mass repatriations in the order of tens of millions, including revoking citizenship. To me, this seems both implausible and imprudent, as this gives our enemies a monster to point at. Um, yeah, that's, um, this is impossible. I mean, it's possible for Europe it's possible for Europe because Europe's claim is stronger. And people say, oh, well, your claim is what you say it is. Uh, yeah, if you had 100% of the power, you could rewrite history. But but humans being humans and being at least somewhat aware of history, uh, Europe's ability to somehow wind the clock back through, through hopefully voluntary repatriations it, it, that's actually possible and, and maybe could be pursued through policy because their demographics are more consolidated. They have a better claim. Uh, th their wealth is, is less. And so there's, there's less of an, there's less uh, of an intelligent state to kind of subvert popular will. They're, they're in many ways, paradoxically more vulnerable to populist movements uh, because of how their system works and because of uh, how their intelligence services doesn't work. So I think there's a possibility that Europe is, uh, you know, that they could do this in Europe. This is impossible for North America. The destiny of North America, insofar as it will return 
to something that is more classical, where people live around people who are like them culturally and religiously, is some kind of balkanization, which may in fact happen. Uh, but this, of course, goes against the interests of the total state and against the American state itself, which always wants to consolidate power. Uh, I, I So again, this is the tension we have in our own lives. And I would expect to see the American empire falling away from the periphery and then working its way into the center. That's how it almost certainly will occur. So, so look to Europe, look to Asia, look to the disintegration of the of the American empire. Maybe even look to Canada. Who knows? Although there, there you have another, you have a whole other uh, set of problems, which is the fact that Canadians have no ability to actively politically resist these pressures in any meaningful sense. Ben Gaines for five dollars USA. Purely out of curiosity, seeing as you frequently mention your father being German, is your last name Anglicanized? No, it's not. Um, I believe that my mother had a German ancestors who had Anglicanized German names. But Anglicanized German names are a product of a particular era of American history, specifically World War I. If you were German and you went through World War I and suffered the whole, like, the Huns coming to kill us stuff, you Anglicanized your name, right? Uh, my, the, the German side of my family and my father's side, they didn't, they never came to America. They came to Canada. And, and when my father was naturalized to being an American citizen, that was like in the 70s, I think, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, at, by that point, no one was, was talking about Fritz or the Hun coming to rape American women, and no one felt the need to Anglicanize their name. But as I really, really, really want to avoid talking about my last name on this stream, uh, I, will, I will cease dropping hints and, and go back to the Spurg chat as my friend the Franklin calls it, and see if I can... Guys, if you want a free question answered, you got to use the at tributist sign. It's, uh, it's, your, it's your opportunity. I'm not going to you know, necessarily pick it up, but I'm trying to fill time here. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, more questions about Gamergate too. I, I don't know. What are you guys expecting, right? Uh, people are going to get angry at these these consulting, but the, these, these will consultants... But like I've said, this race stuff is literally baked into American law. It is the elite religion, which all modern judges are, are raised in and, and, and believe. And well, at least for the most part, believe at this stage, the belief in this religion is, is, is falling away precipitously. So there is some, um, there, there's a problem in that dimension. Um, yeah, apparently I forgot the, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, guys, I'm not, I'm not Jewish. I mean, I think I might have like some fractional piece of DNA that's Jewish from my mother's side or something like that, because it was from the, it was from the, the, the Ellis Island, uh, you know, literal melting pot. Uh, but, but the, um, everyone was like, oh my god, I, I look Jewish. I, I do look Jewish. I look very Jewish. You know, the, and this is a little more, but, but it, genetically, that does not hold up if you do the 23 in me. So you, you guys got to think of something else better. Maybe you could call me Armenian. I still. Can't wait for the right wing to go from uh, Ashkenazi Jews to Armenians being the secret ethnic group behind everything going wrong. I mean, you've got Anita Sarkeesian already, uh, Anna Kasbarian, all, all of these people, you know, system of a down guy. Uh, the conspiracies write themselves. That's all I'm saying. Also, if you're Californian like me, there's a much bigger Armenian community in California than there is a Jewish community in California. That's for sure. Um Thoughts on dysgenics? Uh, I mean, it's a reality. I mean, dysgenics is naturally... I mean, it, you know... I, I, I don't know. I mean, look, I'm I'm convinced that dysgenics... I'm, I, I'm convinced that dysgenics is occurring. As a Catholic, I believe that you could probably stop dysgenics just by reinstituting Christian social norms so that women picked for marriage rather than picking for... Uh, I, I don't really know what women pick for in terms of actually having children. And so so if you shut down sort of like the, the big, if you kind of fix the pipes, so to speak, and shut down the big avenues of degeneration that you see and the big perverse incentives that exist in modern welfare states, a lot of this stuff would probably go away and it wouldn't involve any kind of weird early 20th century stuff with eugenics. Probably this stuff is just a product of, 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 of weak culture. 
And I, I think that, you know, eugenics just opens up a whole bag of worms. It's obviously unethical from a Catholic point of view. But but it's, it's also just a disaster from a sort of C.S. Lewis abolition of man point of view. Uh, there's there's no possible way to manage this inside a stable society unless it's so absolutely incrementally slow that it would be imperceptible to to any given person in any, any generation. Like if you just decide, okay, like we're going to get rid of the, the cystic fibrosis gene in this decade and then maybe next decade we'll take out another like disease gene that this obviously doesn't have a problem with. Like you could do it that way, maybe. But if people are design, designing babies and... And, and, and like one upping each other on some kind of social platform, then that's going to completely, um, completely capsize your society into absolute utter chaos. It, you'll remanufacture the racial problem inside communities of people. They'll be at each other's throats. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, this this is a product of civilizational cycles. I'm convinced. And so we just have to ride the tiger of this stuff. Human populations are probably going to follow the predictions that people like Edward Dutton make, where really in the future, the only people who are going to be have sort of or, uh, the, the concentration of sort of good genes will be predominantly in religious communities who, who maintain sort of the standards around sexuality and still have children with 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 people that that have um you know genes that are, that are, that allow them to be professional or act in a professional capacity but it, it's a very very hard thing to predict because everything seems so unstable um okay uh comparative civilization book recommendations that aren't oswald spengler uh well there is the other one the collapse of complex societies um by i did this one in my book review it's one that's coming to mind right now the complete the collapse of complex societies by tainter tainter that's it uh that that's a that goes over very similar ideas and it's not it's not like this this dry german prose like oswald spengler is that might be more useful to those out there who are looking to get a little bit more uh in, in, into the stuff and, and don't want to jump into the monstrosity that is that is spengler um yeah i mean the the number one thing all people have to keep in mind is like ride the tiger Multicultural communities are not the end of the world. They just work differently than monocultural communities. There are a lot lower trust. So the way you survive in multicultural communities is you make high trust bubbles inside low trust environments like the Armenians do. <laughs> to pick a more PC example, right? You make a high trust bubble where your moral standards apply inside your specific community and that's the way you sur survive inside even densely packed multicultural areas. It's up to us to build those things. And it's not just a single solution where it's like, oh, just, just, just go back to Europe. Oh, just run to the hills. There has to be an ability to survive everywhere. Because the biggest advantage in times of chaos is the ability to react to emergent situations in creative ways and in ways that are smart in the long term, which is why we have dialectic to begin with right ben Gaines for five dollars usa a great name purely out of curiosity seeing as you frequently wait i already answered that question okay <laughs> let's do the next one luke brasher for five dollars usa hi dave i listened to your content for a while now and i successfully introduced your stuff to my brother he has poked fun at your soy boy like voice but i tell him that you just detransitioning from being an atheist leftist uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I have, what can I say? I have always had a very nasally voice. I have had a little bit of a lisp since I was a kid, and I'm also from California. And and being, living in blue states all my life gives me that kind of, um, that kind of uh, blue state up talk. You know, the, same, the same way that, that um, what, what did Geo say, Giant Geo say? He said, manager voice has become equivalent to gay voice <laughs> because you're always supposed to be up talking, always being positive. Oh, hey, that's so good for you. How you doing? You know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, in, insufferable. But, but thank you very much, Luke. I appreciate it. Outramer for $10. Evening, Dave. I've been thinking about the early 2000s. We'd be interested 
in what you think of a uh, what you think of fakery in the era of late Bill C, early George W. Uh, Bill Clinton, early George W. And the war on terror, honky tonk nationalism versus Islam, Iraq War, 1998 to 2008. Was there anything of value to come out of that era, in your opinion? I mean, I think you know, you've isolated like the one of the most fake eras of. I call this the hollow decade. I mean, there's, there's all the, you, you isolate. And I wouldn't, I would say that the, the 2000s was 2001 to 2012. I, I do not think that it ended with Obama. It ended with the great awakening. The real Obama administration did not begin until he was reelected. People don't remember this, but in the first Obama administration, Obama was very much coloring within the lines and and testing the water and although i think that the dear colleagues letter which marked a sea change in, in a lot of universities i think that was sent out his first administration it didn't get teeth until like 2012 2013 uh, it's really the great awakening really when the obama administration just went fuck it we're, we're going balls to the wall with what we really want america to look like uh because all of Obama's first administration was just trying to pass and preserve Obamacare. That was its main objective. Uh, after that, the the, um, the 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 output was entirely focused on uh, on 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 the Great Awakening. Uh, what what do you say about the hollow decade? Other than I need to finish my video series mm -hmm. on it. Which I, I I made the first installment in 2019 when my son was born. Just after my son was born. So it's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a it's been a hot moment. Um, I mean, I remember that whole period being really fake, and and being transparently waiting for something to happen, which eventually it did in the form of Obama. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I remember from the era. Uh, is there anything to learn from it? I mean, there's tons of things to learn from it. There's tons of things. I mean, you're watching the old world slowly fade away. What I remember about the 2000s is that it was a very horny time. It was it was a place where everyone was constantly going nuts. Like it was it was the most coom brain decade imaginable. People weren't even aware that 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 culture shouldn't be so crude. You know, this is why Judd Apatow was such a popular a popular filmmaker. Is that there is this this idea that if if sexuality were let free and let roam of its own volition, then everyone would just be better off and we'd be more liberated. And obviously that wasn't true. But there was also this idea. I mean, two thousand. This era also was where the internet felt like it might actually deliver some good. I mean, one reason why everyone is so despondent about about everything right now. One of the big reasons that people don't usually talk about. Is, is that it's, it's really very obvious that the internet was in many ways a very bad thing. Now, obviously, I have a, a, a side hustle, podcasting and writing on the internet. Uh, and I probably would if, if, if we had still stayed in Web 1.0, if, if we had kept 1990s technology. I still probably would have a blog and probably a lot fewer people would read it. And, and I probably read it with my friends in real life or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, that would be its own thing. But by and large, the introduction of social media in particular, along with mobile technology, so I mean, the three, three horsemen of, of the internet apocalypse was, was social media, widespread social media, you know, widespread social media, the introduction of mobile devices like the iPhone to keep you connected all the time, and then women. Uh, just just women uh, that environment and i guess you could you could add in a fourth one to make it parsimonious parsimonious and say politics because once politics women social media were online all the time and in an environment where pressure and cancellation could be done it, it, the entire society turned into essentially the long house on steroids and any kind of creativity that was going on was immediately stifled not, not to mention the fact that uh, the, the dating culture immediately was was pancaked by that new development. 
And, and so one of the reasons why everyone's so despondent is that, you know, every now and again, like people, people do this, they, they post videos of technology and people get scared of it. And I think to myself, that technology was around in the 1990s. Why is everyone scared about it now? Well, it's because in the 1990s, everyone thought that technology would always be used for good. But now we've seen a 10 year time period where the technology that we all swallowed and, and, and clapped like seals for had an unmitigated, not an unmitigated, but, but an overall negative effect on culture. And no one can come to terms with this. No one can talk about it. Uh, we're, we just exist in our own little internet bubbles. The, the right has a huge incentive to break these internet bubbles down and reestablish public life, which is one of the purposes of basket weaving. Ba ideally, if you are in charge of a successful basket weave, the, 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 there's two things you want to kind of become, or maybe three. You want to become an artistic community, an artistic and social community for right-wingers. You want to become a fraternal society, and you should see like the Old Glory Club for that or the many others that are building off of basket weaving. Uh, this is a platform, not not an entity itself. And then you also want to become uh, a, a social club that has its door open for normies to re-engage with humanity in the flesh and to kind of own space that way as such and to kind of reverse the effects. Because, I mean, the reason why we're also pessimistic is that now every piece of technology we see, we immediately assume with a lot of justification that it'll be used against us in short order, which, you know, again, that's not a, a, a um, an emotion that's not, that's unjustified given what we've seen in the, in the last uh, period. Um, before I get on to Bjork's, um, Bjork's uh, super chat, I'm going to go do some Spurg chat farming here, blah, 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 blah. The only future I can see for Western man is something a key to the uh, Huguenots who became buccaneers. Oh, that's interesting. That's a very Bappian solution. I imagine that the sort of band of pirates model might be useful for highly multicultural areas. Can the right wing ever respond on the new wealth of uh, being non-American white while still holding their meritocracy myth? Tech is Chinese engineers and Indian leadership. Social as an X. SoCal as an X. I, I don't really know how to parse that linguistically. So um, uh, someone asked me how my trip to Victoria was. Uh, well, I mean, if you're talking about like half a year ago, it was awesome. Uh, we might be going out that way, potentially in a more permanent capacity uh, in a year. But right now we don't have any imminent trips to go uh, out back to BC. Uh, but, but we do love, I mean, you know, I love the Pacific Northwest. I wish it wasn't occupied by, by shit libs and, and by, by our enemies. And, and it's, it's, it's horrible when you think about it. Um, anyway, I, I, like, I, I should probably look at the Spurg chat sparingly since it's, a, it's a, it's a mess. And a lot of these things aren't, aren't put together right linguistically. Uh, Bjork for $5 USA. How should right-wingers frame environmentalist issues? Many are rightfully and intuitively afraid of the power of these narratives lend to our opponent, but the typical denial strategy does not work, and adding nuance is not a strong counter-narrative. Yeah, I mean, don't, don't, like, don't, don't engage, like, first of all, like, don't engage with this global warming people. Like, just don't. Like, these people have never been amenable I, I tell the story all the time, but being in a university environment, I uh, I knew a bunch of people, and I was um, I was a progressive, like libertarian progressive. I kept on going back and forth between being just like a standard Democrat voting progressive, and then trying to do something crazy like voting for a libertarian candidate or whatever throughout my like high school and college years. But I talked to people in my college town who who were ostensibly experts in this stuff, and then when I when I went to school, I took a geology class with somebody who was ostensibly an expert on this stuff. And, and in the meantime, I would be going on places like, uh, you know, image, uh, not, like message boards, me like political message boards and like forums that hosted debates between various different fringe ideas. You know, I even, I even went to like the dark side of the internet, like VDare. I'm like, oh my God. 
Like I want to be there. I, I, I'm like, like, I'm a horrible progressive. I'm reading Nazi articles and all this. I was reading everything, right? And so what I do is I, I um, consult before before Climate Gate. If people know what that is, right? Even before Climate Gate, I would kind of drip the standard sort of in global warming skeptic answers. You know, academic like these are legitimate questions about how the whole. Uh, anthropogenic global warming theory works. I I I I drip them out to these experts, and they they were like, they never had considered these ideas. They were complete deers in headlights. They couldn't answer basic objections from their opponents, and then I had listened to them in a year uh, give a talk on NPR, being billed as a climate expert. Uh, don't debate the climate people. We can have a conversation in our own spaces. And indeed, like there's, it's not like global warming is bunk. It's happening. It is being driven by carbon emissions to a certain degree. But there are subtleties in that narrative that make the overarching story of a runaway warming that will imminently destroy human civilization wrong. As if we couldn't tell that by the fact that they were imminently predicting the end of human civilization 25 years ago, and it hasn't happened yet. It's, it's very, very obvious that this is being overstated in a deceptive way. I'd sidestep that. As an environmentalist, you are a conservationist. You are about the land and the landscape and sustainability. Sustainability is something that in, the left talked about all the time. Now it's used as a synonym for carbon emissions. But when I say sustainability... When I, when I talk about it in a useful way, as I'm talking about sustainable human populations, sustainable cultural arrangements, uh, thinking long term about the place you are, how does this place not become a human anti-hive by <laughs> unlimited immigration? How does how does how how do we learn to live in coordination with the land in a traditional mode? How how do we live inside of history? That's something that Thomas 777 has talked about a lot. And I've had many disagreements with that individual. But you know, he has a point. Like, humans want to live historically. And that's the only, only in the context of living historically does, does deep conservation make sense. Does being connected to a landscape make sense? It isn't, you know, you don't need to be a racial you know, autist who, who does like purity tests on, on their DNA or who, who can't, you know, who, who spurgs out every time he sees someone marrying someone from outside their ethnic group. But there has to be a concept of posterity where there's a genetic line that goes with some mixing as always occurs from one generation to the other with a constant set of traditions and, and faith carried over father to son. Only in a context like that does a long-term concern for the environment even make sense outside of this mindless, like, oh, you know, we're going to light ourselves on fire in the middle of the intersection so that we can stop oil. Or we're going to we're gonna break into a French museum and literally, I mean, this literally happened. They literally, I mean, this was going to happen eventually. Eventually, the soup they were throwing on paintings was going to leak through the actual container and destroy a painting. I think it actually happened in France with a Monet. Uh, yeah, okay, great, guys. You, you destroyed a priceless painting that stopped oil. I mean, you know, and, and if you don't, or, or we need to stop global warming by giving, un, you know, another $5 trillion to these NGOs. Um, we, we have to point out about how futile this actually is and refocus on landscapes and refocus on the intergenerational ethical obligations to preserve those landscapes by living inside of them, just like we live inside of history and not outside or over it. That is how right-wingers have to frame environmentalism as something that is properly right-wing and, and not an extension of the professional managerial class's desire to get another $6 trillion given to global warming NGOs or for hysterical, I'm sorry, women to destroy priceless paintings from the 19th century to feel like they're vindicating their, their own need for relevance in the modern world, or to, to vindicate their own lack of meaning borne out from the absence of religion and children in their own lives. That's the response. 
Uh, do you think living a low carbon lifestyle could help people live in, in traditional gender roles? Uh, no, I, I don't think, I think we need to get the, this low carbon thing, remove that from nobody cares about carbon and it's, nobody can count it. Everything admits carbon. Humans admit carbon. Babies admit carbon. Everything admits carbon. <laughs> Every living being that's not a plant or or some other kind of photosynthesizing organism admits carbon or methane, and methane's even worse than carbon. Uh, once you get into the mode of counting carbon, you have lost the game because you're going to need some kind of like super powerful machine learning or AI tool to do it accurately, and those tools will be controlled by your enemies, and they're always going to tell you, now, I can guarantee this, the carbon counting machines that the, our leaders will provide us will tell us that my baby is a carbon in a negative carbon impact, but contrapoint gender reassignment is carbon neutral. I guarantee they'll say this. It makes absolutely no sense. It makes absolutely no sense, but that's what they'll say because that will be the political the same for the same reason that Gemini can't draw a white version of George Washington. That will be the answer that pops out of the carbon ca calculators. We have to stand away from the carbon calculation. We should care about the environment. We should care about admission emissions. Although I really think we should be focusing on a particular matter and not on carbon or methane and not on carbon. Uh, but it's um it's uh it's that's what I, what I would focus on um uh okay thank you very much i'm going to go on to the next super chatter uh ben white for five dollars moved to the final rounds of interviews for the remote job what are your thoughts on remote work if i get a job should i move to the boonies to lower cost living or should i live in a major urban center and try to have a better social life well i mean that's more or less your choice, Ben. I mean, the, the the disadvantage of the boonies is the poor social life. That that is the disadvantage of the boondocks. Uh, it when when you pay for, I mean, I, I don't exactly know the details of your life, so this is a question that I can't answer for you, right? And and so, if you move to an urban area, you're going to have an easier chance finding a woman, even if. Even if you are looking for trad women, just because the the concentration is heavier, uh, and you know, you know, so so there so there's that right, and there's also more of the social life aspect. Uh, you really do not want to be spending a large amount of your salary on rent if you can possibly help it. So I mean, if you had discipline, the ideal way to do this would be to live in some very very low cost area. And then just take public transportation into the city and then develop hobbies that require you to tra travel. And if you set yourself up really, really, really well, you could always in the weekend or after work go into the city and, and have some social engagements. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, and, and I've lived in both urban areas and in suburban areas, your social engagement is a matter of scheduling and will, not necessarily always living in the most populated area imaginable. If you don't have any friends in the big city, you will just be in your little, you know, bug man pod playing Fortnite or whatever for all your free time. But but if you're disciplined and and, and you want to do social stuff, there's no problem living in a low income area or in a more sparsely populated area and then and then migrating into the city. If you want to go to the absolute boonies, I think that's I mean I, I recommend it if you're if you're really dedicated to homesteading. But but that is a project that you really need to look into beforehand because there's no young people. Uh, it's very, very hard to do the kind of thing where you live in a low uh, a low rent area and then commute into the social environment where you, where you can meet people. And also when you have kids, unless you're living among family already, you have absolutely no support. And as a parent, what I, I've learned about is that your ability to live in a highly, you know, in, in your ability to sort of chase the ideal rule, rule life or the ideal job is 100% constrained by your support network. And that's something that very few young people appreciate. So I'm, I would just take that all into consideration. I think that if you, if you hunt around right, you could have the best of both worlds. But again, 
That's going to depend on how disciplined you are, right? You have to be like, okay, it's 6 p.m. on a Friday night and my and I had a hard day at work and, the, and that comfy gamer chair is looking really comfy, but I have to tell myself, no, I need to go out and see live music or I need to go to band practice or I need to go and, and play on my uh, on my varsity basketball team or, or tennis or fencing, right? I need to get I need to get on, and I know I'm gonna be more tired, but like I've dedicated myself to do this, right? Like, uh, you know, making commitments where you have to do them socially is a good way to get around that. And you know, obviously these days most people meet online, and obviously like there's always basket weaving, right? I'll throw it out there, right? Uh, as, as our own little attempt to do this and um, and to get people into organizations. And it's essential to have a, a, a backbone socially, usually with members of your own sex, before you gain the confidence for, for most people. There's exceptions, obviously, right? These, these are all generalities, right, I'm speaking in. It's very much important to get social confidence before you go out and know how to really interact with women in particular because they'll pick up on that stuff a lot. Plus, if you are if you're out there doing things socially, you have date ideas just lined up, right? So it, it, it these decisions all depend on you making trade offs that are amenable to your personality. If you're a homebody, it might be worth it to force yourself to go out more than if you're a social butterfly. Christopher James for five dollars USA. Do you agree with academic agent that they are slowly putting the woke away in some areas? Does it really matter since anything eventually ends up left anyway? Uh, Robert Conquest's second law, for instance, uh, that that is the law that says everything becomes left wing that is not explicitly right wing. Um, yeah, I mean, there, like I said before, this is a, this is a generational conflict within the left. The, the the sort of master manipulators, not master manipulators might be a little bit bad way to put it, uh, the, the, the more experienced seasoned operators that are running these managerial organizations, they understand the extreme danger they are in with the further fracturing of the country. They want to walk back from the precipice. They know that the, the, the millennial activists are nuts. And so they want to put the woke away. But the thing is, is that they're slowly retiring. So the analogy I always give is someone holding a muscle, right? And the muscle is getting tired. They have to constantly try to put the woke away. And they are trying to put the woke away. You can see this. But the thing is, is that it, it's not working. In the 1990s, they really put the woke away. There was this huge explosion of political correctness just before Bill Clinton's second election. And in, in like two years after the Republican Newt Gingrich people won this the Senate and the House back, all of that stuff just disappeared. It just it just disappeared. And it was American normalcy. And you, I mean you heard a few things like Ralph Nader complaining in the background, but it, it was complete all of that left wing stuff was completely put away for about ten years until you heard of it, from it again. Outside of university campuses, obviously on university campuses it's still proceeded, but I mean, they're not going to succeed in this because they are subject to the same rules as everything else. And this is the thing with AI too, right? Like people are really kind of like departing. I mean, like obviously there are a lot of concerns that go into this technology and I'm not saying that you should disregard it at all, uh, but, but AI is still a finite organism, even if it was artificial general intelligence, which it's not. I don't think it's even approaching that currently. But even if it was artificial general intelligence, it would still operate in a world that has to play by rules. <laughs> and it would still have to operate like other living organisms have to operate, even if it did have that, like you know, gigacycles on these GPU, it would still have to obey rules. And the same thing is true for progressives. It does not matter how powerful they are, the fact of the matter is that their old guard people are going out and the young and sane people are coming in because they started believing their own bullshit. This is a natural degenerative process that all living organisms go through and it's happening to the left again. All right. Uh, nerve. Actually, I should use some, some of the Spurg chat before I, I circle back to the, um, the, the, the paid things. 
Do you see an exodus of white Americans to Europe? Uh, no, absolutely not. It, uh, guys here, you know, the Europeans keep on, on doing this. Like, oh, you need to come back to Europe because the demographics are better. I mean, okay, A, like, if I go back to Germany, for like, that's like the usual one, right? Because people know that I'm ethnically German. I, my, none of my ancestors have lived in Germany, well, really ever, because by the time they were in the physical area of Germany, it wasn't Germany. It was, I don't know, Baden-Württemberg or whatever. I have no idea, right? But like this this whole European idea that Americans need to come back to Europe is is bizarre because the, the regulations on immigrating legally from America, I mean, it might be easy for a migrant to just pop on over and get benefits. But if you're doing this legitimately, it is a pain in the ass the housing is more expensive in Europe than it is in North America, which is your number one financial consideration. Your pay is significantly lower. And most of the natives consider you to be a carpetbagger, even if you do speak the language. And I don't speak German. I mean, it's like, you know, I took like three years of it in high school and I used to speak a little bit with my grandmother, right? But like, no, it's not there. And I will never speak it fluently. Even if I live there, it's, it's, there's so many reasons why it's just not a good idea. Uh, people have to be able, I mean, the, we need to develop power where we are. We need to develop community where we are. And, and if we can consolidate based, I mean, if you take over Germany politically, the way that Bukele has taken over El Salvador, then, then maybe the conversation changes. If you turn Germany into German Israel and, and you've got programs and like there's a propaganda campaign that that like integrates German Americans back in, then that immediately comes a different conversation. But without that consolidated political power, all I'm doing is is replicating the current problems I have with my government to a different area that I'm less adapted to thriving in. And so for most Americans, it's a very unattractive proposition to do that. So um, uh, someone's asking me about watching the Apostolic Majesty's review of Morrowind. I have never played any of the Elder Scrolls games. My wife has played them. I don't know if she's played Morrowind, but she certainly played Skyrim because she talks about it constantly. And I just, I, I don't know. I can't watch a review. Um, I, I guess I did watch about 50 minutes of that ContraPoints review of of. Um, uh, of the Twilight series, even though I never read the Twilight series. I, I watched one of the movies, but I, I can't, I, I have too much limited time to watch a review of, of a of a product that I haven't actually read or consumed. So unfortunately, I did not catch the Morrowind review. People have told me it's good. Um. Okay. Uh, Nerve and V-Maker, didn't realize the green in your profile is a reference to Graham Green. I read his Brighton Rock and was impressed. Pinkle was a terrific villain. Like Milton's Satan, he put into the body of the awful Dodger. The last line of the book was also brutal. Yeah, Graham Greene is a wonderful writer. He's, um, you know, obviously The Power and the Glory and The End of the Fair are the two ones that I've read. And then some of his short stories. He, he's most famous for writing The Third Man, which is my father's, I mean, you know, more famous as a movie than as a book, right? But uh, The Third Man, I believe, was semi-autobiographical about his time in post-war Vienna. And this was my father's fam a favorite movie because as a young child, he was a, I guess he was a war refugee. Yeah, he was a legit war refugee in Vienna in, in, in 1945. And... Um, uh, the, the early 40s before they migrated, I guess after the war, they, they went to the hinterlands uh, in, in Austria, but then they migrated to Canada. So he's aware of what uh, post-war Vienna was like. And so he was always a big fan of the third man. So yeah, I'm a huge Graham Greene fan. Um, you know, one of, I don't know. I mean, it's been ages. It's one of those people who it's, um, I, I read him at a certain point in my life that it was just right. And I'm a little bit concerned that if I go revisit him, I'm going to, it's not going to hold up, but no, he's, he's wonderful. And I think he'll be remembered. I think he'll be remembered favorably when we look back on the 20th century as someone who was able to realize in advance all the problems that were going on behind the scenes and not sort of very prominently. Uh, Asteroidal Assassin. Are we just going to ignore the fact that Gollum is black? 
<laughs> Gollum being the Tolkien character, not the uh, mythological con construct from Jewish legend. Tolkien described him as a dark creature, a black guy obsessed with jewelry. What did Tolkien mean by this? Uh, I mean, fair. I never really thought that that Gollum had had black skin. I always assumed that it would be like pale and sickly skin. And I'm certainly convinced that whatever other racial imagery may or may not exist in Tolkien, I'm pretty sure Gollum is not a stand-in for, for African characters. But hey, uh, you know, if, 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 if one thing is, you know, this is the one thing uh, I think, and I was, I'm trying to maybe write a Substack essay on this because now every time I have an idea, I'm like, oh, Substack essay, Substack essay, Substack essay. Um, you know, because I'm getting faster at writing them these days, and they, and they last longer too, which is what I love, right? It doesn't feel like a live stream or a podcast where I just I speak out all these ideas into the ether and people forget them. Um, but the um, uh, one thing the rights learned from this whole Starship Trooper slash Halo fiasco, and I don't know how we haven't learned this before, uh, books and movies and media are living texts. I mean, we you know we mock the living constitution. And indeed, once law becomes living, the whole understanding of English common law goes right into the garbage. So in, in a sense, uh, the, the originalists are correct in the living constitution debate when it comes to common, uh, when it comes to interpreting law inside English common law. Right. But, 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 but in actual reality, living documents are tugging on a certain amount of truth. And that is that, that when we engage with media, we are engaging in a dialectic with the author across the space of time. And and when you read a book, it's not always the same book as when you read it before, like The NeverEnding Story, right? It, because you change and the world changes. And so when you read War and Peace, again, certain elements stand out to you. When you read uh, when you read 2666, when I'm rereading that book now, certain elements are, are standing out to me more now than they did in the past. I don't think I understood it at all. And now I'm, I'm kind of getting something from it, right? And, and so these, these pieces, pieces of literature, what makes them exciting and what made media exciting before the Great Awakening was that it was living. Uh, you could go into a movie and actually have some kind of revelation about your life that you were just being beaten over with a political message. It was, it was actually engaging with you on a spiritual level because all spiritual engagement is living. All spiritual engagement is a, is a living spiritual dialectic. And so what we realize in this, I'm not, what the right realizes and left is not, is that these, um, these spiritual dialectics uh, speak louder than the actual intentionality the author often does. So if you create a piece of work that displays heroic, young, good-looking people fighting against bugs, that creates a counter-narrative that is spiritually as legitimate as the director's intentions. Uh, because that story is there, too. It, it, you, you, can, you, you can interpret it as an artifact that way. And, and you can draw strength from it that way, especially in the case of Starship Troopers. What makes the Starship Troopers dialectic so funny? Because the original book was much more open I think it was kind of neutral on these ideas. It want, it was trying to portray these ideas as something interesting, as something that you you should consider in a positive, open way. It was much more open to the right wing ideas that it described than 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 was obvious the obviously like ham fisted satire that was Paul Verhoeven's movie. Uh, we need to embrace culture as living, not because the text you can just lie about what certain texts say not so that you can read the bible and then blatantly lie about what it says about sexual ethics uh, but but because we are trying to come to terms honestly with with what with with with, with text interacting with the world we live in and not just sort of like all of these reddit leftists they 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 have bromides that are the messages from their media and then they just they just bleat the message over and over again like yeah i get it Obviously, Paul Verhoeven was making Starship Troopers into an anti-fascist piece of satire. But that anti-fascist piece of satire is easily the least interesting and least entertaining part of Starship Troopers, which is the message that we were trying to get across to them and then that, that they never got. 
Asteroidal Assassin for $3 USA. The only reason I consider Turks white is I don't have to consider myself being the sake uh, the same race as Hassan Piker. Sorry, Dave, he's one of yours. Um, well, you know, <laughs> it, it, he might indeed be. I mean, I wouldn't be the first person, the first person to to notice that almost all Kemalist Turks, the people who support Ataturk or Ataturk's vision, since he he died, you know, in in the mid twentieth century, sometime, uh, all the Kemalist Turks are. Distinctly more European looking than the people who follow Erdogan, who are distinctly more Asiatic looking. And, and the joke among all, well, the, the politically incorrect joke is that all the Kemalists are the descendants of the Janissaries and the, the European uh, harem brides that the Turks kidnap from Eastern Europe. So <laughs> the ruling class is like probably some insane amount percentage European genetically through that intermixture, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, Son Piker, what a tool! Uh, what what an absolute tool! Uh, anyway, going on, Asteroidal Assassin for three dollars USA. I forgot to include this point earlier. Despite being a leftist and considering the human government, uh, I forgot to include this earlier. Despite being a leftist and considering the human government had. Considering the bad human government and Starship Troopers, I probably would end up joining the military if I was in Rico's place. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the military is portrayed very positively in Starship Troopers, uh, and, or at least the book, right? The movie had this like weird satire dimension, so it was speaking with two voices. And that's the thing, like, what does everyone remember about Starship Troopers, the movie? You remember that, I mean, maybe leftists don't remember this part from Starship Troopers, but you remember the classroom lectures from, and he literally repeats uh, parts of the book where they explain the failures of democracy and the failure of establishing order in democratic systems. It, it literally reads like an excerpt from Mencius Molbug's open letter to open-minded progressives. And uh, that that's the most memorable part of the movie by, by a long shot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally sympathize with that. I'm going to go back to the uh, Spurg chat just to see what people are saying, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> as soon as you read from the entropy chats, people stop at replying you. Um, what do you think should we, we should use for kids' media? How do you regulate kids' internet usage? Um, well, my wife has an iPad, and I try to keep that thing away from the kid as much as possible. Uh, this is... The problem with people, what non-parents don't realize about this is that, well, it is possible to not raise your kid with the iPad. It is impossible to raise, a, a, you know, a four-year-old without him knowing about iPads. And once he sees those things, he wants them. And so, as with all toddlers and very young children, they throw temper tantrums. And it is very, very easy to toss them the iPad to to get yourself to kind of get a get out of jail free card from an incredibly embarrassing situation. And once that they know that's a possibility, then it constantly becomes a political argument. But I mean, you do what you can. Um, I mean, one thing I do is I, I try to get him to use older tech. So he really likes music. And so I, I try to get him to use a CD player as opposed to, uh, you know, like iPods or whatever uh, to, to try to remove that screen from the equation. But of course, there's all sorts of problems, not least of which the fact that you don't have CDs as an adult person living in 2024 anymore. I, I sold them all. I used to have a huge library of them from when I was in high school and now all, all gone. And of course, e even getting blank CDs to burn is hard. Not to mention the fact that the CD players that they make are pieces of crap and they break easily when they're thrown, which happens all the time when you have a young kid. So, yeah, it's challenging. Uh, Juniper Tree, friend of the channel, talked about some kind of uh, screen-free music player that was designed for children, and uh, it might be worth looking into, but I'm trying to not buy electronics. <laughs> so, there you go. The Wooster for $5 USA. I notice you have a, the habit of unconsciously calling any random type of content an entertainment product. Isn't this a misnomer since most of the content is hardly entertaining and barely a product? Content is 
content more than suffices for a description. Well, you know, I don't know. It's hard to say, right? I mean, Gamergate's a perfect example of that, right? Gamergate for most of us, for, for most of the old heads was a chance to seriously do a political blow against the reigning progressive orthodoxy, which we had reasons to hate for other reasons. For most of the other people who were watching us and participating in that, and I wasn't an original Gamergator. I was somebody who hopped on very late and was trying to push the Gamergators in a more right-wing direction, in a more consistently traditional direction. Uh, but for everyone else, for an enormous number of people who were in the scene, it was just about the lulls. It was just about being entertained. And once things became a little bit too real and a little too scary, everyone just went on to the next way, the next, the next entertainment and the next, and they, they went to where the positive vibes were. And I guess we all knew that transition was coming at some point, but it's, um, that, that's what happened. And that's what, that's why I call things entertainment products, because even if the thing is serious, for an enormous number of people, it'll just be something to, to kill time while they're playing video games, right? I mean, you know, I, like, I watched 50 minutes of ContraPoints. I didn't watch 50 minutes of ContraPoints. I had like, you know, I had a long day, got back, you know, put the kid down. It's like 11 p.m., too tired to write. So I, 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 I put ContraPoints on for 50 minutes while I uh, try to like put paint on a model. You know, which is like, that's my default activity when I'm too tired intellectually to either read or write. I'm like, okay, I'll just like slap acrylic paint on a plastic miniature. I haven't bought a plastic miniature in years. They're just, they're all in cues, right? I, I need to do something with my hands, you know? And um, so I, and even then I couldn't, I could not possibly listen to that droning drug addled wreck for more than 50 minutes, prattle off stale women's talking points uh, while they gabbed into the camera, like faces of death, all life drained out of them. Do people remember Natalie Wynn and ContraPoints from 2016? That person was sharp as a tack. They were on point. They had a vivacity to them. Now they're a zombie talking like this into the camera. And even their jokes, their jokes are recycles of all their older material. They're, they're recycles of jokes that they made in 2016 when they still had um, uh, a, um, a, a brain that wasn't drug addled, either with hormone replacement therapy or with ketamine. Someone's asking me whether I ever read Steppenwolf. It was my favorite book in college. And Steppenwolf was principally the second part of that video that I started but didn't finish and uh, will not be named. But... Maybe maybe I'll get around to it, but yeah, I have read *Sip and Wolf*, and I have a lot of thoughts on it. It's a great book. Um, by Herman Hesse, who was who was absolutely a shit lib. If any if anybody thinks that this anti-white stuff was a product of the 1960s, I urge you to read. I mean, Herman Hesse was both kind of based and kind of cringe at the same time. And the cringe stuff he writes was really cringe. He might be the first person that wrote like an anti-white screed. And some of like, read his short stories from just after World War One. If you think this anti-white stuff is a product of the '60s, it absolutely was baked in uh, right after World War Two. Uh, Lee Scott says. I had a progressive girl tell me that The Godfather was a mediocre movie because it didn't have a strong message on masculinity. She didn't elaborate. She watched it for a film class. What do you make of this? It sounds like something Patrick Bateman would say before splitting Paul Allen's head open. <laughs> have you seen The Godfather? <laughs> really, The Godfather 1 was all right. But when The Godfather 2 came out in 82, I think it really came into itself, both artistically and professionally. <laughs> Robert De Niro's presence gives the movie a big boost. <laughs> and the whole movie is cons had a consummate professionalism into it that really makes it pop. Uh, I, yeah, I can, see that. I can see that totally being part of the Patrick Bateman routine. Um, 
I, I can't do the American Psycho voice, but I, I really should memorize that because you can really use it on anything, right? A- any piece of media you can talk about in, in that in that Patrick Bateman monologue with Paul Allen. Uh, it, it, totally classic. I mean, The Godfather, what can I say about it? I mean, it's a better movie than it is a book. It, it's fundamentally about the old world coming into conflict with the new world. And weirdly enough, the old world winning the old that that's kind of like it is kind of reactionary in the sense that i mean it is about masculinity in a certain way you've got one brother who's way too masculine in the toxic sense you've got one brother who's way too effeminate and then you've got michael the the middle brother in the middle trying to hold the the ends together trying to be the best of both worlds and in the end, the only the only choice he has is to become his father, and, and it, because circumstances force him into that. But I mean, I, I never really saw the third one, but and it is sort of a tragic downfall to a certain degree. Uh, but but it is very much a person being consumed by the old world. It's not the story of because because the mob is very much an institution from Sicily. And, or, or, I mean, I, I don't think it actually was in the 20th century. I think that this is a fascination of Mario Puzo and, uh, uh, well, who, um, uh, Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, I, I think that, I think that the American Italian mafia was very much an American creation. But the, the whole idea is that this is this is something that that's a Sicilian institution that's been just transplanted, and it sucks people back into the Sicilian mode of being, e- even no matter how much you send your kids to Harvard. And you know, as we know, the story of the 20th century is not the old world colonizing the new one; it's Harvard and the the modes of of the the wasp world and the progressive wasp world colonizing and destroying the old world almost entirely. And so, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, the Godfather is a good movie, but I do not think that it tells the story of the 20th century. It tells the story of a certain place where, uh, you know, people are experiencing in many ways the exact opposite of what everyone else was experiencing in the exact same time. The experience of Italian Americans in the 1940s was not the story of Michael Corleone. It was, in fact, the exact opposite. The the brother that goes off and joins Harvard becomes the head of the family and makes the Italian family more wasp. He doesn't get transformed back into a Sicilian mob boss for the most part. But um, that's all I can say about it in this limited time period. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Argos. <clears throat> For $5. Hi, Dave. Would you ever consider reaching out to the owner of Kiwi Farms, Josh Moon? You said that you don't like the forums, but Josh is at least building and defending digital architecture that isn't hostile towards the right. I mean, sure, I'll reach out to him, but what what do you want me to say to him, right? I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that he's trying to flip a bird to the cathedral. I appreciate the fact that he is the enemy of my enemies. And I sympathize with him, especially when one of his enemies is Kevils, who's a horrible individual as far as I can tell. I never met Kevils, but if I were to rank internet leftists, Kevils would be, I mean, there there, there would be con, 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 contrapoints, and then there would be Va, there would be Vosh, then there would be 300 layers of shit, and then there would be Kevils right on the bottom. Uh, this person's horrible, and the fact that they're enemies with Kiwi Farms makes make me sympathetic. But but I had nothing to say to Kiwi Farms. My whole shtick, my whole purpose in doing this is to get real-life organization and to reach out to, to elites, both online and in, in the real world, and to build alternative community that way. Uh, Kiwi's, Kiwi Farms is going in the opposite direction. Ki- Kiwi Farms is, is about online drama. I don't care, like from a business point of view, I don't care about that. Um, someone's woken up. I hope hopefully my wife can get <laughs> my son there. Um, I'll move on if, unless it gets too loud here. Um, hold on, I'm going to mute myself here. Um,
uh, pardon that interruption. Um, Asteroidless Assassin for $3 again. What is your most left-wing opinion? What about your most right-wing opinion? Um, excuse me again. Um, what is your most left-wing opinion? What is your most right-wing one? Um, that's a hard question. Uh, most left-wing opinion. <laughs> I mean, I guess I was literally just entertaining very, 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 very slow genetic modification. I, I, I wouldn't say that that's an opinion of mine. One thing you need to have as a streamer is a room that is quiet and has a door that shuts. And I do not have that in my current house. So I apologize for the interruptions, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I do not endorse any form of genetic modification. I'm a Catholic, but you know, insofar as it becomes species threatening, I'm just entertaining ways you could do it that wouldn't immediately exterminate all of mankind, which, you know, I think that the difference between that and the fully Catholic position is good to keep in mind, you know, <laughs> you know, when it comes to, you know, taking a haircut and, and having your, your species destroyed. Um, you know, I think the distinction is good to keep in mind. What's your most left-wing opinion? What is your most right-wing opinion? Uh, my most left-wing opinion, like culturally speaking, I mean, Sorry for the interruptions, guys. Um, uh, culturally speaking, I mean, obviously I could just say like, oh, I think that jobs creation programs are my most left-wing opinion. But that's not like, jobs creation programs are not a left-wing opinion. Right? Like economics, left-right distinction is just not an economic idea. It's a social organization. It's an authority idea. And it's a cultural idea first and foremost. The, the economic stuff is more or less secondary. If a right-wing government were to take power in America, all of these socialist, good government leftists would immediately become libertarians and 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 go into like tearing down the government. If if the government were ruled by right wingers, they would immediately do that. They would immediately be give the power back to the people, make you know, make make uh, give money to the um, uh, make things more divided economically. Freedom of choice, freedom of association, they'd, they'd all do that. Um, I'm trying to think culturally what my most left-wing opinion is. My, my most right-wing opinion is I think that, you know, people need to be controlled by a, by a strong monarchical figure and by a strong paternalistic force that needs to be enforced on their lives explicitly. I don't see any way around that in, in some, some way, shape, or form. Um, I, I don't know why Australia was asking. I'm having a hard time thinking of one. Uh, okay, here's my most left-wing opinion. I think that if I were to just be king, I, I think you would need to have an area of the country that would be cordoned off for degenerate behavior. Uh, who There was some Catholic thinker that said prostitution is like a latrine. It, it is absolutely filthy, but if your palace doesn't have one, then it's going to start smelling. And I think that a certain amount of degeneration has to be tolerated at the margins of society as a pressure release valve, as a pressure release operation. And I, I think that is a left-wing idea and I don't see any way around it. So at some point I think like these, like, oh, let people do what they want. Like, it's a cop-out. It's a sign of weakness. But if I were an actual monarch and it didn't have to deal with pe this this sort of let people do what they want being used as a tactical way to undermine my moral positions, I would probably seriously consider letting degenerate people do what they want to a certain degree and in certain places just simply so I could dissipate the political uh, the, the political pushback that would naturally come from from instituting an, a a more a, a more traditional and authority driven perspective in all other aspects of, of life, you need to have spaces for people to do that so that society doesn't kind of explode in on itself. Ben White for three dollars USA. Millennials are set to become the richest generation in the world eventually, as the boomers die and pass on their wealth. 
Will this be a net positive? What will replace the boomer truth regime? The millennials will not be the richest generation in the world as the boomers die because they don't have the habits to maintain that. And boomer wealth is being spent right now. It's not being invested. If the boomer wealth were being absolutely optimally invested for transfer, then the millennials would, would become the richest generation. But that's not happening because all of the wealth is being spent, be given away, which all goes back to like these NGO organizations, uh, or it's or it is it is being invested in ways that are highly taxable through the government. So all of that money is going to go back to the cathedral, or most of the money is going to go back to the cathedral. Now, if you are the children of a very smart boomer couple, then you might make off like bandits. They might invest it just right so that the government won't take it all and they won't have spent it all by the end of, 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 of their lives. But I would expect most of the boomer wealth to be plowed back into the government either for vacations, for medical bills, or just given back like in, in the way that Sting did. Uh, I do not count on inheritance as your mechanism for, for getting wealthy. Build professionalism, community networks, and competence. That is going to be your bread and butter as a millennial as you as the boomer truth regime crumbles underneath our feet. I mean, there's a great example of this from Jeremy Carl the other day where he talks about, oh, uh, what is this? Um, yeah, Mackenzie Scott. So Mackenzie Scott is the richest woman in the world. What did she do to earn her money? Well, she didn't. She divorced Jeff Bezos and walked off with half of the biggest fortune ever. What did she do with it? Well, after taking tons of trips to Europe, I'm sure, and tons of vacations, she's essentially just giving it to progressive NGOs. <laughs> she's giving it all away to these progressive organizations that, um, that, that, that support all of the woke issues that we all know and hate. And so while we scrounge around for funding for organizations to, to do anything, uh, to push back or to take a single university, all of those progressive organizations are getting billions and billions and billions piped right into them. That is the story of boomer wealth. But that is not what is what's going to replace the boomer truth regime because all of those organizations, including the government itself, are going to maintain the boomer truth regime. They're going to keep this truth regime going even after it's long since been a transparent lie. The end of the boomer truth regime begins right here in the right wing. That's what makes this space interesting. We are the space for a new and interesting art. We are the space for challenging dialectics. We are the place that you can speak your mind. We are the place where young men who want actual change and want to have that instantiated in the real world come to meet and plan for things. And that's what makes this exciting. That's what makes this... It's certainly not because we're super popular or because we're playing into some kind of parasocial game. It's because we're building actually real social things and the real utility of new ideas. Uh, I mean, not necessarily like new ideas and the fact that no one's ever thought them before, but ideas that actually work in the real world and that actually give life to the human organism as opposed to just being this stifling, repetitive entertainment product. And there is that word again. Now, like, a good example is Demon Mama. Like, I, you know, I was watching this this Demon Mama stream where, where, where that individual, and this is a horrible person, I mean, I just like this total degenerate. I mean, I'm sure there are wonder there's there was a wonderful person there, like underneath all of the layers of of borderline personality disorder and narcissism and parasocial grift. But but that's the only thing you see on the screen. And this individual is just, of course, because their their sensibilities are 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 put off by a friend of the channel, Isaac Young. Um of course, are just dishing on this person. And what do all leftists do? They they scour their social media profile and they look for the most the most vulnerable thing, and then, and then they create a mythology about how that vulnerable thing is is exposed. That person, you know, it's completely made up. It's this completely made up story about how this person is 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 a horrible loser because of this one post they made on Twitter or whatever. 
you know, and and of course, what is what is Isaac Young known for in our circles? Well, being a brilliant cultural commentator, <laughs> creating very interesting Twitter threads that the left has to farm for its own reaction content, and genuinely creating, you know, and I encourage people to to read this author, even though I haven't, because I don't have the, I guess in my to read list is, is is stacked up this high, but but it, but if you are in the market for fiction. By reputation, he's one of the people that's making new original science fiction and fantasy in this genre. Uh, that person is, is is making an interesting intellectual space, and and these these horrible streamers are just grifting. <laughs> they're just they're just dead cycling through the same set of talking points again, and again, and again, and not making any progress, not doing anything interesting. Or I mean, like you're not learning anything. You're just feeling validated to have the opinions you already have. You're hearing reviews of video games that you already like. You're hearing assurances that your ideas that you already hold are correct. Um, you know, and to a certain degree, you're getting that listening to me. But I, I hope that when you're listening to this stream, you're getting new ideas of what to do in your own life that are not, strictly speaking, being a fan of this channel. I hope you're getting encouraged to build social organizations in the real world. God knows I talk about the resources that you might have available to do that. Or you're thinking about potentially becoming a patron of, of these people like Isaac Young or or the Passage Prize or, or Juniper Tree for, for your more art craft side. Uh, or 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 geo right the you know all of these people this is living culture it's living culture because we ex this is culture that is new it's original it exists in history as a contextual entity and and it contains things that actually help you or that 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 reflect actual life in the real world and not just the cyclical vanity of, of self validation uh, I have the Twitter refresh as opposed to the Super chats. I might stop doing the Spurg chat because I need to get through these actual paid chats. But thank you very much. Pac-Man Respector for $10 USA. Do you think that there will ever be a harm committed against the GAE? Assaults, violence, or worse? I'm surprised at the total passivity by most. Even those who have had their lives completely destro destroyed and theoretically had nothing to lose. I don't wish for any, but I'm surprised at its absence. Well, I mean, I mean the 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 thing is, is that it's it's sort of trans. I mean, violence is sort of transparently futile. I mean, you saw what happened with January sixth. <laughs> like this, this very very small riot essentially gave the GAE all of this power, <laughs> roiling up for for four years. Uh, I I don't see any point in this. I mean, I guess I, I guess I'm a little bit concerned that young men are so content to stay in their own rooms rather than actually organize in real life. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm also worried that Zoomers in particular don't have uh, the agency or the testosterone to get out of their own way. And they, they're completely in a mode of learned helplessness. Uh, but but I, uh, violence is absolutely useless other than it might indicate that you've got a little bit of testosterone. But just like that guy who burned himself for Palestine, like there's nothing that comes of that. It, it in some ways, it helped his enemies. Uh, Feudal gestures are just not where it, it's not useful for anyone, you know. Pac-Man disrespecter for ten dollars USA. Can you give us a white pill for those pessimistic for our future? Often, I'm afraid the regime will continue the encouragement of racial violence and replacement against us. Or, God forbid, in their dying days, decide to commit a more active form of erasure, even if we can form parallel communities. Um, well, I think that I think what the thing is you're seeing is that this AI technology stuff is not anything that's radically different from what we've had before, at least the stuff that we've seen. It's a little bit more lifelike. It's a little bit more scary. But all it is is a reflection of the same bad decisions our leaders have. It does not save them from the internal ideological contradictions of the system. It does not auto-win them wars. It does not pacify a population. And it does not remove their need to obtain legitimacy. Their legitimacy is in the process of completely collapsing. 
if we can come out of that, and I think that there's a high probability that we can, being the only group of people that is well organized in real life with the ability to talk like actual adults and be competent in the moment, then I think that we stand a damn good chance of being able to take real political power back at a level where we can stabilize and defend communities against all comers, either by conquering the entire GAE, which sounds like a long shot right now, but in the long term certainly is not, or balkanizing it to the point where we can come out with the pieces of it that are needed to essentially get through this dark age and into a new civilizational epoch, a new era of religiosity and belief from which we can sort out all these problems with, with these horrific technologies from a mode of strength and not from a mode of weakness like we are right now. But thank you. That, that, that's my white pill right now. That's, I mean, the, the, the macrocosmically, you will feel more white pilled if you get yourself into better shape, if you, get, if you are able to get a family for yourself, if you're able to live among community, if you go to social events, especially with, with the basket weaving, getting ideological friends in real life. All of those things will help you feel more white pilled than if you just doom scroll. Don't doom scroll. Don't, I have freaked, I have found myself doing this. I have literally freaked out over seeing tech demonstrations, like this guy like shooting things with lasers. That technology was there in 1993. <laughs> this is old technology. You guys saw it and I freaked out because I was doom scrolling because my, my mind was in a mode where as soon as I saw something, even if I had seen it before in, in, in a completely benign setting, it freaked me out because I was in the mode instantly of thinking that they're going to use this against me and my children. You've got to get out of that mode. You have to think the rules of reality have not been suspended. It is the same contest of wits and wills and civilizational ethos as it has always been. And it is the same human conflict, just filtered through more areas of unreality. That layer of unreality is their greatest weapon against you. But we have the truth. I mean, we don't have the truth, but as the side that is not constantly lying, we can at least touch the truth. We're, we're not beholden to sort of narcissistic narratives uh, about, about, about how our own imaginary genders are valid or something like that. We don't have to maintain these illusions. Uh, we, we can see the ugly truth and we can also reach towards some greater human hope. That's my white pill. <laughs> I hope it's I hope I hope it helped. Asteroidal Assassin for three dollars USA. Dave, I just realized the reason why you're against raising the black IQ question is because it will make a race stronger, smarter people, sun resistant people. Oh okay. I, I sorry, I just realized you're I realize the reason why you're against raising the black IQ is because it will make a race of stronger, smarter people, sun resistant. Uh, I know what's up, Dave. Uh, so I guess the reason why I'm against eugenics is not because I'm Catholic. It's because I'm against uh, the, the idea of re uh, of creating a race of, of black uh, Wakanda super soldiers that will conquer the world and destroy everyone everywhere. Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> well, I mean, I, this technology cannot work as hitchlessly as people imagine it. And what people don't understand is that it's going to explode and cause a lot of human harm way before it generates anything like what people imagine in their nightmare scenarios. And, and so it, it, if it even, you know, even if it didn't work the way that the, the advocates say it will work. So, yeah, I mean, th that that's one a uniquely racially supremacist uh, nightmare scenario that I don't oftentimes hear about, but there you go. Thank you, Asteroidal Assassin. Derek Gutierrez for $5 USA. Very reserved high school senior here whom never initiates talks with girls, but wants a girl for prom at least. Every girl either seems to see, be stone-faced or probably has a boyfriend. Haven't had a girl talk to me all school year. Advice? God bless. Um, okay. Uh, Here's how here's how um, you do it. I mean, so you're just asking a girl out. She's not your girlfriend. 
you know, I, I had a girlfriend in, in my last month of high school, uh, which I deeply regret, but, you know, not really something I want to talk about, who I went to the prom with. Um, uh, here's my advice, right? I mean, like, you've got guy friends. Are the guy friends going with um, going with anybody? Well, then ask them if anybody is looking for a prom date who wants to go. Uh, so you, through your guy friends, know in advance who are the girls who are looking for prom dates. And then just ask them casually, like, oh, hey, I thought you might be going to a prom. Would you be interested in going? And then if they say no to you, just kind of like laugh it off. Like, okay, <laughs> okay, I'll go on to the next one. Be So, I mean, I don't know. This is something that I didn't really n- know how to master. But you want to have kind of like this laid back kind of jokey attitude ordinarily as a facade that's very, very low pressure for women. Like, oh, I just thought you might be looking for a prom date. I'd be, are you interested in going? And then and then just ask them like that, sort of nonchalantly, as they used to say. Do people still say nonchalant? What you want to avoid is something that's high pressure or awkward. Especially if you don't know the girl very well, right? But figure out in advance who are the girls who want to go and who are kind of in the market for dates, which when I was in high school still was a thing. And how, how can there not be girls who are in the market for prom dates? Usually there are a lot of girls who are in the market for prom dates. And then you, you figure out and then, you know, or, you know, figure out the girls who are maybe thinking not of going, but would be interested in going if they did have a date, which is, I think, a larger set of girls than the girls who are like, I'm going stag or I need a date desperately, right? Um. And then just ask away. Um, one thing about high school is that it's, it's awesome. It, most guys don't make use of this. Uh, and I don't want to scare you or anything. But um, you'll realize in hindsight that, that after you get uh, to be 19, things get way harder for guys. And it's still a little easier in, 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 in college. Uh, but, but you really want to try to get some practice in talking to women and asking them out in high school. Because when it when it gets to college, things get way harder. Because girls get uh, when they hit eighteen, like uh, you know, the 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 barriers that are keeping older men from them are removed, and so your your market possibilities get lower, at least initially. But it, but but look, keep it casual, keep it jokey, put feelers out in your network of friends and your network of other friends. And uh, girls love setting people up. So if you even talk, if you have, if you're acquaintances with a girl who's going, just say casually like, "Hey, I was thinking of going to prom. Do you know anyone who might be looking for a date?" At least in my era of high school, that was done. But I don't know. That's my best advice. Thank you. Uh, ben Way for three dollars. What is the cause of the bug man death drive? I can't wrap my head around the mentality. Is it hyper individualism or is it a perverted spirituality and a desire for something bigger than oneself? Well, I mean, it's 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 the meaning crisis in short, right? The the bug man death drive is, I you know, I mean, I, I don't be crude about this, but I, I way back when in two thousand and twenty one, I think. 2021, I made a video about advice for young people in their 20s. And I said, the main thing you want to re- avoid in your 20s is the dopamine um, the, the dopamine depression cycle, right? So like you, your brain gets the dopamine hit and it needs the dopamine hit. So then when it doesn't get the dopamine hit, it goes into panic, right? And so you'll, you'll realize this is that when you get adrenaline, you get less panicky. But if you spend all day listening to podcasts and playing video games, the second you see something a little bit threatening or the second you see something that's a little bit disruptive to the ordinary course of existence, you immediately go into panic mode because your brain's worried that that dopamine's going to get taken away. Most left-wing culture is literally organized around keeping that dopamine drip feed going on in real time. Their entire spirituality is focused on having a constant drip of self-validation coming into them. Even that's that's why it's so rare to find a left. I and mean, I suffer from depression a little bit too because I spend way too much time looking at screens and doom scrolling, which is playing into that dopamine depression cycle of constantly having your brain go into an anxiety attack every time it's a uh, pleasure buttons taken away from it, right? 
Um, the uh, the um, the, that's what's the Bugman death drive, is that it's it's it, it needs to freeze dialectics, so that they're always the winners. Because they're so afraid of taking a punch. They're so afraid of actually engaging with life. And in, with, in life, you get hit. You hit back. You get tired. You get the adrenaline flowing. There, it's a constant motion. It's a constant struggle. It's a real dialectic. When you're reading a book, you want to be challenged. And, and, in, in the, and, and all leftist culture right now is about removing challenges and pain. And when you do that, you remove life. And your life becomes this brittle, fragile glass thing. And eventually, like all brittle glass things, you want to shatter it. That's the death drive. The, the drive to be internally a child. And then when the, 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 to be an eternally frozen as a child or frozen in the moment of, of the porn consumption dissipates uh, the anxiety and the fear and, and the self-loathing comes in. And, and that's what... Um, that's what drives it. So yeah, it, it, we we in the internet age, we are all in many cycles like this. But just imagine for the leftists who who don't have broader things to care about, like eternal things to care about, that cycle is like their entire existences. Flesh and Spirit for ten dollars USA. The book by George Sorrell, Reflections on Violence, just came up on my radar. Do you know this book? Thoughts? It will it help me re-enchant my thinking. What book will help me re-enchant? Well, I mean, I I've heard of George Sorrell's reflection on violence. Uh, I have not um, read it, but if you're looking for books to help you re-enchant, uh, the author that I will mention, and this is not original, this is very mundane, is Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky, you read him and you immediately come in contact with a certain level of humanness that is very, very hard to ignore. Another mundane author is Chesterton. I know it's like a stereotype. I am, I'm slapping my head. Oh my God. You know, re-enchant. Uh, Gene Wolfe uh, is a favorite of mine as well. Uh, you can you can try that. Um, anything from the 19th century that's readable can oftentimes help you re-enchant fiction is really good but like if you're a zoomer and i get the sense that most people asking me these questions are much younger than me you have to train yourself to read physical books and the more you can read these things where it's 100 percent of your attention on the page the more you're open to the enchanted element of, 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 of what's being contained inside that book and the more you'll feel it. If it's in the background, if you're listening, I mean, if you're listening to it and taking a walk, then maybe you'll get it. But if you're multitasking while like listening to like Dostoevsky, you're going to lose a lot, a lot. And, 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 and a lot of you young guys, I know this because I do this too to save time, uh, you you use these uh, these books as, as as found time when you're doing chores, and that's not going to be an enchanted experience. It, it just won't be. Um, but but thank you very much. Uh, take K, uh, tack caves for three dollars. Thoughts on Dune two? I thought it was one of the best films of the last ten years. Well, I'm I, I, I'm my wife's dragging me to see it tomorrow i think um not so much dragging me because i don't want to see the movie dragging to me, it because i don't want to pay for babysitting but but she is I, I, I have to say I, I i'm so lucky to have my wife because she has literally kept my social life alive uh, by forcing us to go out every now and again because i would fall into the mode of being a shut-in naturally by my own inclinations so I'm so glad that she's taking me to see this movie. Uh, and I'm also a big Dune fan, so I'm looking forward to it. Although I'm so I'm so ready to be disappointed. I, I, but I can't give you a review because I'm, I, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, e. Franny for $20 USA. Dave, have a couple of beers on me. We appreciate all you do. Well, thank you very much. I hope I can get more essays out. I'm predominantly an essayist. How do people feel about I think is in order to make a, a a YouTube video, I'd have to take some time off from writing essays, 
And I have some vacation time up. Maybe I maybe I could take a, a chance and, and do an honest to God video. It would be interesting. Uh, Rafferty Horton Sar for for three dollars worth, and thank you very much for that donation. Very generous. Thank you very much. You're helping me see Dune too. <laughs> it's gonna go right to the babysitter's pocket, <laughs> right? Rafferty Horton for three dollars USA. What is your opinion on? Academic agents, BS, BS, BS. Therefore, I deserve to rule anti-ideology stance. Um, well, I mean, it's basically Machiavelli. I mean, that's... If you, <laughs> bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Therefore, I deserve to rule is basically the... It's basically the fortune cookie version of Mosca, Pareto, and Machiavelli. Hence the name, the Machiavellians and the Machiavellian school of thought. Um, it's fine. It's fine. It's a good lens, but it's leaving something important out. And that important thing is my own saying that I've heard people say a lot on streams. I don't think I invent, I literally cribbed it from a Warhammer 40 K book, <laughs> which I believe is the last one. I don't think it even is the last heretic. I don't even remember which 40 K book it is, but it's, 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 Never forget, this is a war of belief. And the thing is, is that bullshit, 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 therefore I deserve to rule, is absolutely true. That is what all governments are. But it does not take into account two things. It does not take into account the fact that you can't just bullshit your way. It actually has to be a genuine belief in order for the government to work. And so you can actually lose the mandate of heaven if you lay on the bullshit too thick. And then the second thing it doesn't take into account is that there actually is truth. There actually is true spiritual reality that you can believe in. I believe God, I mean, I believe God is real. Everyone knows that, right? And so I believe, I, I do sincerely believe that you can have political formulas that are more or less in line with divine nature. And even just for the sake of argument, well, I can't quite imagine there not being a God writ large, but let's imagine that God is very, very minimalistic in like the deistic sense, right? And Christianity is wrong. There is still alignment of your beliefs with human nature itself. You can still have belief systems that are more amenable to human health. And, and so the question of bullshit, 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 therefore I rule even if it is absolutely 100% what rules governments, which is, you know, it's an exaggeration. There's a, there's a law of that in most human governments. It does not get you around the imperative to discover true, good, and beautiful beliefs to guide your people. Because the success of the government and the alignment of the government with the people's interests is going to be heavily, heavily, heavily dependent on the trueness of the narrative political formulas they are using to justify their rule. Hence the mandate of heaven. And hence why you never want to forget that this is a war of belief. Asteroidal Assassin for $3 USA. Dave, how do I cope with being a misogynist? Even the thought of rad femme Hitler raises my blood pressure. Is this just brown aggression? Well, I don't believe in brown aggression. You're not even getting the racial stereotypes right. <laughs> Aristotle's racial stereotypes is that Europeans are more aggressive than Asians. We've always known that, right? Asians, whether whether they have brown skin or yellow skin, are always supposed to be more passive and and uh, sneaky, and 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 the white skinned Northern Europeans are supposed to be the the the, the bloodthirsty barbarian hordes. That 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 are savage in their ferocity. So we're not even getting our stereotypes correctly. Um, as for misogyny, I mean, look, a little bit of misogyny is healthy, right? It's like you know, it's like uh, the alcohol is a poison, but it, but if you keep the concentrations uh, it, it, rightly, or salt is a poison, right? But if you keep a little bit of salt in in your food, then it just makes things a little bit spicier, right? Um. I don't know, man. I mean, I think like the 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 rad fem rad fem Hitler is an act. Like you all know this. Like I think Alayla. Like there's two for for those of us who are not on X. There there are two perennial like female villains that beset all right wing influencers on Twitter slash X, and that is Ayla, who is this uh, rationalist professional whore who 
who, who may be the, the most prolific public whore since Messalina, the wife of Claudius the god. Uh, Messalina, the, the wife of, of Emperor Claudius, very famously had a contest uh, with Rome's most prodigious prostitute over how many men she could sleep with in a single night, and she apparently won handily. And uh, and uh, <laughs> Ayla, not to be outdone by Messalina, uh, had a, uh, a, a a birthday group sex where men literally filled out applications, and she graphed this on a gigantic flowchart showing exactly who did what to her and with what percentages and the rejection rate and, and the, the flow-through rate of each interaction, which is just absolutely one of the most revolting things from the modern technological age I've ever seen. And, um, you know, and I've seen AI art. And, um, yeah, and the other... So, so Ayla, everyone on the right wing, men, women, always complain about Ayla, and they always complain about Rad Femme Hitler. Unlike Ayla, who's a deeply damaged individual and someone who I feel deep sympathy for, and I want her to get professional help, Radfem Hitler is, this is an act. You guys know that this is an act. She is, she's performatively a misanthropist to, to get your guys' goat and to get you to retweet her stuff with disapprobation. That's the game. It, she's encouraging misogyny so that she can get really, really angry at men and then fight back with anti with with insane anti male sentiments. Uh, misogyny, like intellectual misogyny, is stupid. Uh, this our race as humans is a sexual race. It only works with both male and female. They're, they're, the women aren't wrong. They're just sometimes in the wrong place societally. And you have to remember that constantly. Uh, I, I don't, I'm, I, I want to, women shouldn't vote. I don't really think anybody should vote to be quite honest. But, but I, I definitely understand why when, when politics and women interact, there is this really negative side effect where, where you have these, these hysteria campaigns kick off. And there's really no stopping them. Oh, when, 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 especially when all the women are, are linked up in social media, and you just can't reason with these things in any way that's that's at all productive with society. Um, yeah, but just always remember, women are necessary and women are beautiful, and they contain a piece of the image of God, and that's just as much a piece of God as is man. And the only reason why you're getting irritated at their nature is because it is being put in the wrong place, so to speak. Nerve AMV Maker for $10 USA. I'm skeptical of the right's aversion to technology. I'm unaware of any conflict where the side that swears off technology comes out on top. Most of us would be shit libs without the internet and learned about these ideas through gaming communities. Going offline to write poetry seems like a retreat. Look, I'm not saying, look, I don't think, I wrote, I've written like two or three articles about technology. I'm not a Luddite. I believe that there is a responsible way to use technology. But blindly just going like, it's technology, therefore we have to use it. That's stupid. Like heroin is technology. Do I have to replace tobacco with heroin because heroin is a more powerful version of the tobacco technology I was previously using? Obviously not. Like, nuclear bombs are a technology. Do I have to make a bomb big enough to blow up the entire Earth and detonate it? Because if I don't, then the other guy will. No, I don't have to do that, right? I am not anti-technology. I'm obviously speaking to you via technology right now. Technology has to be responsibly used. And... Our entire world is just gaga on this brain dead application of technology, well beyond its usefulness. And what we're trying to deal with right now is the fact that social media has been harnessed in some very, very socially destructive ways. I mean, and I, I, again, in particular, I don't think anyone has figured out the healthy way for women to use social me to use social media. I don't think anyone has figured that out yet. I'm sure there is a good way for women to use social media. Like Juniper Tree, like I'm very glad that, that she is making art and that I can appreciate her art. I never want to see her face. 
<laughs> right? Unless I meet her in real life, right? But she makes great art and she publishes it and I buy some of it. And, and hopefully it gets published and she's a political ally, right? And it's good stuff, right? Like that's a good use of the internet. But, but you know, social media has had an enormous detrimental impact on human social organization and in particular how women have related to men. And so some retracing of our steps is needed to figure out the right way to balance these things. And, and it's certainly not like, oh, get women off the internet so that women can like lord it over them. That's untenable and it will not work. Uh, so, I mean, really the, the, the game is just to figure out how to actually use this technology, which no one's figured out how to use yet. And, and it's, not, it's not inappropriate in that space to, 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 to look at a technology and ask how it's positively impacted your life. Anyway, thank you very much. Society man, hey, how's it going, man? It's been a while since I've talked to you. Hey, Dave, I know you regularly advise against leaving, but obviously America was built by people who fled regimes that were unable to live under. How do you know when your leaders have crossed a line where flight becomes a valid option and possibly even a moral duty? Um... Well, I mean, it, it, the the lines are. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, here, here's how. I mean, for instance, I'll, I'll say this, right? There, there's a lot of things I could say to answer your question, society man, but but the abstract answers are going to be a lot less useful to you than the specific examples. Let's back up the abstract answer from specific example. The specific example I think is most useful to you is Afroform. Afroform is the right move for the Boer people to be making right now. Their enemies are very weak and are their enemies are homicidal maniacs. The EFF and a lot of the African political parties in South Africa openly brag about wanting to murder Boers and have literally murdered them for decades and decades and decades, even before the end of apartheid. At least there was a pretense to murder white people before then, but now it's just like, oh, I just hate white people, and I want their stuff, so I'm going to torture them to death and their families. Horrific, horrific violence. Arania and Avroforum is the right move for the Boers to make. If there was some objective standard of horribleness, for which when governments crossed it, you'd immediately pack up and leave. I'm sure every single white person would be gone from South Africa right now. But part of this, when you're, when you're talking about your government, you're playing this dance, right? It's like, it's like a snake. The snake is circling you and you're circling the snake and you're saying like, how close and how pissed off do you have to be for me to think, for you to actually have a chance of biting me? In the case of Afroforum, I think that they have correctly understood that the government of South Africa is very, very weak. And the South African government will give them space and land and a certain amount of autonomy in exchange for short-term benefit in terms of cash. And at the point where the South African government completely collapses, then Afroforum will have those resources to fend off any mass aggression which will come at them, which will probably, truth be told, be very, very limited, but not so much because there is a lack of hatred, but because there will be a lack of organization. And the organized minority will always defeat the unorganized majority, even if they stand out like white and black. So, so this is the dance that we have to play, right? If you flee, you lose resources. If you stay, the snake takes a step closer. But the snake is getting tired too. So all the time, you're looking at the snake, thinking to yourself, how angry are you at me? And how many resources can I grab before you come in and hit me like a bug, Right? And so you're trying to get as many resources out before the snake strikes. You're going to, wherever you flee to, it's going to be the same game, except your ability to extract resources 
is going to be harder for the most part, which is why I'm very skeptical of leaving. Now, if you have a plan, if you have a place to go where you've got a solid network and we're literally thinking of moving, you have a solid network, you have a plan to get employment, you have a network of family to raise children, you have a plan for leaving that place for yet another place, you can have resources that are both liquid and static, then like that stops becoming fleeing and starts becoming a plan for relocating, which is which is fine, right? And then you can play the game there too, right? There was this game I used to really like before they killed it, and I still play it eventually, but it's hard to find players called Netrunner, which is um, you know, a variation of Magic the Gathering, but a much better game. And it, 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 it principally features the contest between a runner, a hacker, and a corporation. And the corporation has all of the resources, but the runner is much faster. So the runner is constantly attacking the corporation and like trying to grab resources from it in these small little ways that that like that, that bleed it. And um, the corporation is trying to just kind of organically win by itself by churning away these processes that are more or less passive and not getting bled too much. And the corporation can take moves to try to just kill the runner, right? If, it, if the runner overextends himself, if the runner gets too greedy, the corporation can just kill him and end the game like that. But it takes a lot of resources for the corporation to kill the runner. Um, so so every all, the whole game, it's like, how much can I take before you divert from your course and try to murder me? <laughs> how much can I take before the, the, the corporation just goes... I find enough with this fucker. He's going down. I, I don't care. And then, then what happens is that the, the role reverses. The, the runner runs away and the corporation comes out after him with a butcher's knife. And that's the game you are... And the reason why I love Netrunner so much is it perfectly illustrated that dynamic of running, taking, and then pulling back, right? That's the game. It is not some objective quality. So for instance, like in Canada... It's, it's more regulated, but the intelligence services are weaker. It's easier to kind of fly under the radar because in, in many ways, uh, they, I guess, are more surveilled in Canada, right? In, in America, the intelligence services are much stronger and they're much more paranoid, but you have more legal protections. So you have to build community in a way that is adapted for this. Now, maybe... It just becomes impossible. It becomes like Zimbabwe and you just have to go. But if you play this game correctly, then you will have more money leaving than when you started and more support and, and, and a better developed life. But thanks, society, man. I appreciate the question. Burke Burn for $15 USA. Can the GFP ever address the new wealth going into ethno-narcissist groups while still holding out their meritocracy myth? Tech is a big example. The majority of the tech industry is Asian. UC Irvine in SoCal is now predominantly Chinese and wealthy. Well, I guess Irvine just generally. The Bay has, been, has Chinese immersion schools. Um, I, I think that the GOP just needs to ditch its meritocracy myth straight up for a variety of different reasons. I think that this is a dead letter. And I mean, I think that people will still pay lip service to it. But this is just not how multiracial democracies work. So, I mean, you can call out Asians for doing this stuff, but I don't know what politically you'd get from it because they're, you're hoping that the Chinese parties are going to coalition with your distance, regardless of whether you're neocons or whether you're separatists or dissidents. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the GOP just needs to dump this whole meritocracy stick. It's totally unsuited for our time. We want to reward merit, but this idea that the most per the person with the most merit gets the job every single time. It's never been true. It never will be true. And in the meantime, we need to be able to copy the Chinese model in our own communities in a healthier way and in a way that is more sustainable. And to build an ethnic power coalition that will work with the reality of those people's existences. I definitely do not want to hand the cathedral the tools to squash the Chinese ethnic communities uh, because I know that's what they want. That's what they want. They want the white people to to to, to narc out the, the ethnic Chinese communities and then 
push them down in, in the big crab pile. But what we want is we want a coalition against all comers, against the existing American governmental apparatus to replace it with better government. All right. Thank you very much, Burke Byrne, for $15. Asteroidal Assassin again for $3. Wow, there's still more Super Chats. Uh, okay. Um, what are the odds the don't put the woke away, but just adopt this imperial progressive attitude to justify Israel? I mean, that's what they that's what they want to do. But, I mean, it, it hurts their narrative. It hurts their narrative a lot. And so it, contradictions are not free. They require things. Pen Videla for $5 USA. Love from El Salvador, Dave. I don't believe Bukele's approach would be possible in other countries. El Salvador is an insignificant country in the grand scale of things, so the GAE don't push back too hard. I can't say the same for Europe or the USA. Uh, yeah, at the time being, you are absolutely correct about that. But at some point, somebody is going to become the El Salvador of Europe. And when El Salvador happens, in Europe in particular, all hell is going to break loose. All hell is going to break loose. And if we're doing our work here, we will be able to support these things with an alternative intellectual and artistic network that will possibly be a counter elite for the current government. But thank you very much. Dreadnought for $10. I've never read a Cormac McCarthy book. But one of my favorite quotes for, is from Anton Chigurh, hey, everyone's favorite one. It's the policy would, quote, If the road you followed led you to this, then of what use is the road? Or if the rule you followed brought you to this, of what use is the rule? And man, does this trigger conservatives. It's perfect, better than conservatives, never conservative in anything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, progressives use this the, the quote too a lot. You wouldn't you would you wouldn't believe it, but they actually do use that a lot. Uh, but thank you. Yeah, it's it's the posi wid is a great tool for deconstructing conservatism because you always want to point them back to the fact of what are you actually producing? What are you actually supporting? Gray smog for five dollars USA. I feel like the Witch King should have killed Elwyn and Mary. He's stronger and more experienced. They were only able to defeat him because love and an anti Nazgul blade. It's one of the two things that I would change about Lord of the Rings. I mean, I guess. I mean, I don't think Lord of the Rings is supposed to be a tragedy, first of all. And there's no way that Elwyn could have died in that situation and had it still be a tragedy, and had it not been a tragedy. If the hobbits died, it would have been, in many ways, much more. If, I mean, if one of Mary if Pippin had died, or if, uh, I should say, Mary had died and, you know, Pippin had to mourn his death, that might have been a, a note of poignancy in otherwise very, very rosy ending for the series. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, I think Lord of the Rings is kind of perfect as it is. Eowyn putting away her sword to become a lady is a classic archetype of, of the myth of the female warrior. It's not Joan of Arc, but it's, it is something that it, it had to be, it had to be done. And it, it illustrated sort of a transition that was tragic in and of itself. And it was more in keeping with Tolkien's vision. You know, Tolkien very famously did not like Dune, even though you'd think that uh, from one sort of, techno-skeptical fantasy author to another, he would have appreciated it. It's because Dune is cynical and Machiavellian. And Tolkien's vision was an enchanted world of optimism, punctuated by the necessary tragedy of the world, but, but ultimately one in which a message of hope was being brought to the earth and not a message of, of cynicism or despair and and the whole point of the book is to make us kind of feel alive in that moment. And with Aowen and Mary dead, it would have been much harder to co to communicate the more subtle tragedy going on behind behind the scenes. Keon Kurji for three dollars USA. Shout out to the channel Magna Mirare. Just wanted his video on why George Martin can't finish the books. <laughs> you made a similar video, but no offense, he was a bit cleaner and worth a watch. Well. Thank you. I never heard of that channel, but check out Magna Mirare. Thank you for the super chat. 
Why is it the dissident right doesn't talk about AI art? It's such a win for us and can and can get many normies on the side. Also, which is a lamer twist. Uh, the argument against AI was written by an AI or the AI image and real image was not what I told you they were. Also, which is a lamer twist. This argument against AI was written by an AI or the AI image and real image was not what I told you they were. I mean, they're both kind of like weird gotchas, right? That AI really only has one gotcha and that is it, it can confuse you for a genuine article. But the problem is, is the generative AI can't be meaningful in any way that we ordinarily consider meaning, which has to have an intentionality behind it, which AI does not have. Okay, look, uh, a, for instance, the person a, Isaac Young, who is a young up and coming creator in our community, uses AI art to, to punctuate his novel covers or for his fiction work. And that's a good use of AI technology as kind of like a prototype. But the reason why the right wing does not emphasize this as a silver bullet is that it's an arms race. And if we concede that this is a war of who can fake art the fastest, our enemies can fake, do fake better than we can. Our strength is in reality. It's in reality. That's where our strength is. And we're going to win this war by being closer to reality and by building stronger humans, by building actual intelligence. Uh, once we go like, oh, it was all about the AI art, to just do the AI art and flood the market with AI copies of like right-wing themes. I mean, like, okay. But the strongest right-wing memes were organic sentiments that came from a real experience of the world which AI can copy, but can't generate. So flooding the world with like AI versions of Crusader Kings or AI versions of like Vikings. Great, you can generate 5,000 versions of Viking AI space marine combinations. Uh, what, what manning have you generated? It's great for prototyping. Although... I think that maybe, I, I fear that we might use that as a prototyping tapping crutch a bit too much in the future. And I think there's something to be said for scratch, scratch. Um, but, and, and people have used it f uh, for their private publishing projects, but, but it's not the method we're, we're going to win by being more real and more human, not less real and less human in the aggregate, beating them by saving pennies. Uh, so, but that's, that's my concern. Thank you, Cooper Weirdo. Uh, Ben White for $5. Thank you. I've recently gotten a crippling anxiety about not financially making it or owning my successful business by 30. Although it's stressful, it's helped me do introspection and identify unproductive habits. Did you feel this in your mid twenties? Uh, yeah, I absolutely did. But look, man, I mean, I don't own my own business in, in, in my thirties. I mean, I have a side hustle and a full-time job. It Look, I mean, you know, everyone feels this way in their 20s that if they can't make it to something by the time that they're 30, they're just going to die and they're going to become a loser. That is just not true. You are right that it's become much more winner-takes-all than it was when the boomers were around, but it's not winner-takes-all. And if you keep on playing the game and don't sink into a depression then you will come to the other side having done something that is worth being proud about. And if you keep on playing the game, you are very, very likely to be in a position to get a family and, and to carry forward. And, you know, as, especially as, as the quality of men on the progressive side just continues to nosedive. This, there's, there's, I mean, people are going, there's going to be a crash in the progressive man stock market at some point. And, and there are going to be women who come on the market and not all of them are going to have a sized sexual histories, right? <laughs> there are going to be women on the market who are going to look at people who they weren't looking at before. So there is absolutely a way to get the bronze and silver medals. Do not beat yourself up if you haven't gotten there by the time you're 30. Absolutely not. 
Uh, don't even beat yourself if you haven't got up there by 40. Adjust your expectations, obviously. Uh, d- don't... Uh, uh, trying to get... But trying to like, like, I need fuck you money by the time I'm 35 or I'm just going to be a coked out drug addict. Uh, your biggest chance for being a drug addict is, is sinking into depression. And depressions are built on this kind of like big build up anxiety catastrophe that that's caused by this like high that you stay on too long when you're in your 20s it's really dangerous so always have a plan b you won't fail if you keep on i mean you you can fail if you keep on trying and and, you know pray about that you know but but it's very very unlikely that you'll fail if you keep on trying and keep on purchasing those free lottery tickets that that's my that's my best advice in that regard so well accolade for $3 USA. I made art as a hobby for a while, but I found largely no one cares about classical art or realism. Um, uh, that and shit libs. So, I mean, art, yeah, art is, the art world is replete with shit libs. I've been writing recently. Any advice other than devouring classics? Um, well, I mean, writing what? I mean, at this point, if you're writing... Like everyone, every writer right now, I mean, I don't like, oh, you should hop on the next bad thing. But when it comes to social media, like YouTube is dead (laughs) and Substack is where it's at for people like us. That's where the communities are. That's where everyone is being, is being noticed and circulated. Um, And, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, so I don't like, don't, I don't want to chase, don't chase trends, but I mean, I'd, I definitely recommend checking Substack out if you haven't already and you're doing long form writing. Um, uh, as for writing itself, uh, I mean, if, it, if, it, if it's nonfiction, I read everything I can get my hands on usually. If it's fiction, I go a lot slower and I don't read a bunch of it. I like short stories and I'm unusual that way. Most people don't write short stories and I think that's a little bit of a shame um, but, but it, you know, I, I, I think that I, I think we need more readers. I really miss having more readers. Shit libs were the biggest readers around. And I, I definitely feel the kind of Skeksis mystic things. When I, when I look at sort of these weird effeminate people who sit around and consume product all the time and, and join these fan communities, I think, man, you would just be the perfect person to work and consume healthy right wing art, <laughs> right? and and maybe and maybe not sterilize yourself by the time you're 27. You know, maybe maybe that's the the benefit right wing healthy right wing art gave to you is they made it you made you comfortable actually standing up and being part of the world as opposed to retreating into your little hug box. Um, I mean, advice for writing. I have no experience. I mean, I, I obviously have written fiction. For my own amusement, but I never published anything in this capacity, at least yet. I, people say I should write some short stories, and, and I definitely want to. Um, <clears throat> but but thank you very much. I, I I'd say write every day. I mean, this is the Stephen King advice: like write every day, uh, write when you're not feeling like it. Make use. I, I make plentiful use of text to voice because I can't tell whether a sentence works or not unless I hear it out loud. And I make a lot of spelling errors. So I make use of Grammarly a lot. I make use of text-to-voice a lot. Uh, avail yourself of those technologies, but just keep on writing. Write, 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 write. If you're in your 20s, write every day. If you're a parent, always make writing your first use of your free time. Like, so I have free time now. I'm writing. Then if I get too tired to write, then maybe I allow myself to like, you know, put paint on a on a plastic model or something like but i always default to got free time out comes the evernote and i start trying to write sentences down that sound good or and and write outlines for substack essays or or writing projects or something like that always write always write and then as you do this you get faster and faster and faster and better and better and better and um, try to, I mean, this is the most thankless task in the world is doing book reviews for people. But we really, as a community right now, there are so many writers that are trying to get their stuff published. 
And there are not enough people to do book reviews for these places like Passage Prize and Antelope Hill. And, and if you do a book review and publish that in a place like the Old Glory Club or or any of these places like I Am 1776, I mean, you, you're making yourself a better writer and you're, you're improving the community and you're expanding our purview for readers and it's an all around a good practice to do. So although doing reviews is the most thankless work you can do in a community, it, it really would give us a big boost and it would make you a better writer too. Thank you. Garfellow Roosevelt for $5 USA. Great essay this week, Dave. God bless you and your family. Uh, well, thank you very much. It was a little bit of a labor to get that one out. Anytime I'm writing about data, it's uh, my wheelhouse, but it's... um. It, it, it's less popular topic, uh, even though I know the most about it because I have a PhD in it. Um, it's, a, it's a less popular topic and it's also less fun to write about, but I felt it was sort of necessary for me to... Uh, a lot. Here's what to do. Uh, write essays that you want to read and write the novel and the short story that you want to be entertained by. You write as a writer so that you can figure your own thoughts out. And so I, the last essay I wrote this, I, re, I, re, I re, realized as I was chugging away at it, oh man, this is going to be a really unpopular essay. Why don't I just do another one about why James Lindsay is a moron? But I needed to write that essay so that I could, I'm not, I knew that, that I thought this stuff, but I wanted to have it in a distilled form so that it could be more compact in my own mind. C.S. Lewis said that he, he, thought writing was like having a bad toothache out, you know? And that's the attitude you want to bring to writing too, as a man at least. I think women have a fundamentally different way of emotionally approaching writing that I will never understand, but maybe I can ask Juniper Tree about that. Drennan offer $10 USA. Read that guy who fears the left winning. I do think that the left will destroy us. I do think that the left will destroy us. I remember what happened to Catholics, the Vendi, in the French Revolution. Evil eats the good before it eats itself. But you do but you do have to fight. You can't save yourself, but you can save your soul. Damnation is no option. Uh, yes, but I, I think that the left is definitely going to attack us and hurt us. I do not think it's going to get all of us. I do not think it's going to wipe us out. That's absolutely... The, the left does not have the will to do that. And modernity makes us too fast and too disperse for them to get all of us. But it's going to get a little darker before it gets lighter. And of course, you are right. Damnation is not an option. Or it shouldn't. I mean, it, it kind of is an option, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> Gray Smog for $4 USA. What do you think of the Discworld and Terry Pratchett in general? Um... I mean, I liked them in high school, and then a really irritating group of kind of proto redditors was really into them. Um, I read Discworld. I liked it. I kind of liked the BBC adaptations of it, like the Hogfather one. And, uh, you know, they were funny and, and, and goofy and very, very lightweight. To me, they're definitionally don't have anything to say other than being kind of silly. And my favorite, um, Terry Pratchett, and I don't even really remember this book, was Good Omens. Because I felt that Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman were this this kind of good chocolate, this peanut butter and chocolate combination where Neil Gaiman's constantly pushing things to be more dark than they should be. And Terry Pratchett's keeping things nice and light. Uh, I, I just, I just, I mean, I, I, I never want to say that a good book ever has no message. But Terry Pratchett comes pretty damn close to being delightfully whimsical, but having no message. Although I, I really did like that um, image of that that autistic assassin uh, who tries to kill the um, he tries to kill the the in universe equivalent of Santa Claus by like hijacking the tooth fairy and making all the children of the world forget about him simultaneously. And he's like this super, like, I guess like the autistic killer is already a stereotype, but it seemed like a very, very original way of depicting like a heartless assassin in an interesting way. Uh, Michael Luturno for $3 USA. 
what do you think of cultural Christianity being a substitute for conventional Christianity? I really hate this idea, guys. Like, you've got to keep, like, look, look, look. Like, cultural Christianity has two meanings. It can mean, in the evangelical circles, we want to preserve the moors of Western European civilization because it is a necessary thing for humans to have in order to live historically. If that's what you mean by cultural Christianity, I endorse it 100%. I also support cultural Christianity as I'm an agnostic, I'm a seeker, I'm seeking spiritual wisdom, but I just, you know, I'm a child of modernity and I just can't get my head around the miracles. So I'm going to sit in this holding area called cultural Christianity while I resolve my spiritual issues while I'm in the mode of a seeker. I'm kind of very much thinking of Sargon, Carl Benjamin here, but, but look, I went through that phase. A lot of my friends went through this phase, but Christianity fundamentally has to be about belief, actual belief and actual living spirits and at least one minimal miracle being Jesus's incarnation and resurrection. Uh, that has to be Christianity. And if you sell this idea that you can be Christian and not believe, you will kill Christianity, period, in the most fundamental way. You cannot say that, right? Christian, uh, It's like that line from the young Pope. Everything else is not Christianity, and it stays outside the church. This has to be absolutely clear division here. So while I think it is essential the Christians live in a cultural and historical way that is strictly speaking more than Christianity. And while it's absolutely essential to have a holding area for people who are seekers, you cannot, absolutely cannot somehow pervert Christianity to sell an inferior product. Uh, never. So as long as that distinction is in place, fine. Thomas Raspberry for $5 USA. Well, what a super chats. I guess I was expecting that with the Ask Me Anything. I have a friend at my Orthodox church who has started getting angry at everyone who he regards as falling afoul of science and has now proclaimed a very kid who reads love for it. How do I help his anger as a Christian brother? I have a friend at my Orthodox church who has started getting angry at everyone he regards as falling afoul of science. Uh, and now he, uh, he, I, I, he, I guess he's part of the I F and love science crowd. How do I help his anger as a Christian brother? I mean, remind him that science is not the only truth. If he's Christian. He's Christian. Then he must acknowledge that science is not the only truth. I, I love science. Science is a great thing. We should not give it away. But you can't expect you can't expect everyone to just worship science. We don't worship science. We worship God. And it, it, you have to acknowledge that truth is more than science and God is truth. And, and putting people down or minimizing their concerns because they're not focused on the scientific endeavor is a mode of vanity. And, you know, it's a vanity that I've been very, very guilty of. And some people even say that I, I think politics is like that. And I maybe even am guilty of idol, idolizing politics in my content on this channel. But but that, that these are just these are these are the guardrails of Christianity, and it's up to other people to kind of correct people in this regard. Creeper weirdo for three dollars USA. Why do commies hate farmers so much? It's a constant trend that keeps emerging all over the world, and I don't get it. Well, it's obvious. Com uh, farmers are impossible to be moved into the managerial apparatus. As long as there are independent farmers, the total state has a serious problem because in farmers, resistance movements can emerge. Without farmers, the totalizing state can consume everything. That's why farmer classes always have to be destroyed by progressive movements and by managerial movements. Sorry for the short answer, but it's really just, I think it's really just that simple. Otherwise, they would be comrades in arms, right? Owen Zaleski for $5 USA. Hello, Dave. I hope you are well. I'm working on my PP entries. Uh, PP entries. 
and I'm trying to figure out how writing a story about neo oh passage prize entries. And I'm trying to figure out how writing a story about a neo-Puritan society that looks at self, sex and intimacy. Any advice about writing about sex as a Catholic? God bless and have a good weekend. Um Well, I hate I hate um I hate giving you advice by referencing the most um uh by, by, by referencing the, the worst writer of our generation. Uh, but the worst writer of our generation, M. Night Shyamalan, uh, you know, if we're talking about a neo-Puritan society, well, I guess there was literally like a, 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 a retro-Puritan society. But, but I remember uh, someone told, me, told my wife that the village was based. And so she watched it and I watched it with her. And I said to her, you know, this movie sucks, but I can't help but watching this movie and, and like, like, uh, like, like seeing a fat person and imagining a thin person that they could have been or could be if they dieted. All I could see when watching The Village was the awesome movie that they could have made. They even had like awesome individual scenes inside the movie. And with like some modifications, they could have made the movie a brilliant movie. Uh, Puritans are actually interesting. Uh, well, at least I don't know exactly what sci-fi scenario you're imagining for neo-Puritans, but, but Puritans, once the technological aspect is out of people's lives, individual things like love affairs and family formation are primary in people's existences and they start caring about it. Um, any advice on writing about sex as a Catholic, uh, well, I mean, it's more sexy when it's forbidden. It's more sexy when it's it, 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 it only occurs infrequently. One of the big flaws of progressive writing is that once sex is a routine, as it is in the lives of, of people who are, who are polyamorous or who, are, who are, have these large serial careers of sexual intimacy, it becomes boring. Uh, once sex is dangerous, it's, it's impossible not to be interesting. And, and Puritans are always interesting because they're always angry, too. Or, so it's just like, I can't imagine a Puritan not being interesting because they're constantly angry and they're constantly horny. And, 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 and sex is live or die. If it's a love affair, it's, if it's a love affair that ends in marriage, it's going to be epic and holy. If it's a love affair that, d that destroys them, it's going to be tragic um, I don't know, man. It just—it sounds like a target-rich environment, so I don't know what your particular problem is. But uh, oftentimes, what I like doing is looking at total failures, like the village, and then taking their characters and go, "I wonder how I could do them right." I can't remember exactly who it was, but Neil Gaiman said that a number of the favorite Sandman characters he had was reading atrocious writing and going, "That sucks. I wonder how I could do that right." In high school, I saw episode one. I think it was my last year. I can't remember what year of high school it was. But I saw episode one in high school. And a large, like, I hated it. I'm like, how could this movie be so bad? And I said, I wonder, and I was really, I was really, it's hard to imagine being hyped for a Star Wars movie now. But back in the day, you could be hyped for a Star Wars movie. And I said to myself, I wonder how I could write episode one so that it would be good and using the same characters and so I, I had this whole script for myself written where where it was like a good movie and there was like proper character development and I still think that like if that had been something that I'd actually written as an adult it would have been actually a good thing just change the names uh, that's literally what like 50 state like all a lot of a lot of fiction is just like that sucked the author did the wrong thing. I'm going to rewrite it, change the names, and make it good. The village, but like good. That could be like that would be an awesome thing. It doesn't even have to have the same twist. They could be on a foreign planet. They, they could be in the future. It could be post a Spenglerian collapse. They could be cyber Amish. They could be genetically engineered Amish. You know, there's all it's just you could do anything, right? But starting with a baseline with something that you saw and hate and want to do right is oftentimes gets the creative juices flowing because you can always revert back to the original material for the little gaps that you don't like uh, writing. Drenna for $10 USA. 
Dave, I love to have a stream where you nerd out on things you enjoy. I get that this podcast is about real stuff, but sometimes everyone needs a break. Your best podcast was Aristocracy and the Age of Idols because it involves something you enjoy. Well, it was about characterizing leftists as various forms of pathologies. <laughs> So that was bound to be a popular one. Here's how war, how, how leftists correspond to Warhammer 40k Chaos Gods or the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which are kind of like the Warhammer 40k Gods, right? Uh, anyway, um, Neil Gaiman was the original uh, writer who associated famine with sexual desire in, in the... In, in the uh, the apocalypse, right? So, uh, which would make the chaos gods the direct analogy of the of of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But anyway, thank you very much, Dreadnought Creeper Weirdo for three dollars USA. Why don't we use Conan and Solomon Kane as a way to talk about the difference on the right? Both are similar and come from the same person. It might help a lot. Well, I mean, in terms of the pagan versus Christian dynamic with Solomon Kane being the 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 masculine variation on Oliver Cromwell but but as a globe trotting trotting man in mystery and Conan being the obvious more pagan Nichean kind of counterpart I mean yeah sure it's it's fine I mean the problem is not me I mean I respect pagans as artists that's the their their best contribution to the right wing community the vitalists and pagans best contribution to the to to the to the right wing community is in their art and in in their writing and i respect them for that the problem is is their religion is not real i mean first of all it's not real because pagan gods are um at best echoes of of angelic or nephilimic beings uh that communicated with humanity but i do not believe are directly communicating anymore and at worst like demons or just fake but it's also more fake in the sense that, like, they don't have actual religious practice or living right wing. Like, there are virtually no right wing pagan communities active in the United States right now, the way that there are many conservative and right wing Catholic communities. And so, when they come after Christians for having like weak and cucked boomer members, uh, they they're criticizing us for playing a game that that they're not playing. Like, they don't have a parish that has tons of old people in it who are boomers and whose money comes from a bunch of people who live through the 60s. They don't have to deal with that. We do. So it's an unfair comparison from the start. So that's the problem. That's the problem between the Christians and pagans, uh, not having the appropriate archetypical elements. I respect pagan archetypes a lot. Michael Latournu for $3.00. Do you think the Christian nationalism uh, maintains its prominence through the gradual decay of social cohesion caused by wokeness, or is it a, just a short-term fad? Um, I mean, look, I, 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 I've read Stephen Wolf's essays. They're great. Uh, the name and the branding is absolutely terrible because it particularizes something that should be universal, and it makes it easy for the left to target us. Christian nationalism is just called, if you just read Stephen Wolf's book, it's just called being a normal Christian, historically speaking, living in history. That's all it is, right? And I have no desire to reconstruct the coalition of the moral majority because the coalition of the moral majority is not going to work in contemporary America. It won't work because it's too small to wield power inside a coalitional system of the 21st century. And so, you know, yeah, but, but I mean, Stephen Wolf's ideas on their own, perfectly fine. It's just the branding is wrong. The, I, Christians should not talk about themselves as Christian nationalists. They should say, Stephen Wolf's Christian nationalism idea has some interesting ideas that we should take from, right? But we shouldn't go along going, oh, we're Christian nationalists. Hey, everyone, we're the Christian nationalists. Send all your ire and propaganda our way. Uh... I, I don't know. That's just not a good idea. I, just just say, I am a Christian living historically as a Christian, as have all my ancestors. Okay, last super chat of the night. Drang Frang for $3 USA. Hi, Dave. Do you have any advice on dealing with HIV plus drug addicted gay brother? I think addicts are selfish morons who only are causing suffering around them, but my family is coping hard about saving him. 
Well, I mean, like, you want to save him. I mean, in a healthy society, we, we, we would literally take his drugs away. That is hard to do because now there are all of these cities with activist class classes who their entire goal is just to make it easier for men to kill themselves doing drugs on the street. So I don't know if he's in one of those situations. But if he is in a situation where your parents have control over him, intervention, intervention, get the drugs away from him, him as fast as possible and, and get him into a place where he can get his HIV treated so he can live a, a relatively normal life. I mean, we are our brother's keepers. If it's out of your control, it's out of your control. But get your parents on board, get as many of your friends on board as possible, and then deal with the problem collectively and put it when are we going to make sure that so and so my brother gets help when are we going to do this when are we going to frame it that way constantly bring it back to them if you can do an intervention and coerce them into getting treatment either through resources or through legal means the better chance he has at surviving but i'll pray for you and we should we should all pray right now uh, at the end of this stream, just with a, with a silent intention here, I'll put up right now silently. But that being the last chat, I would like to thank you, Drang Frag, for your contributions and, and thank everyone here for the first one in a while, Ask Me Anything session. I'm really glad I did this. It was a lot of fun. It got me to talk about a lot of things that I didn't have a, a big thesis to talk about. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It'll be up on the channel, obviously. Uh, and uh, I'd like to wish everyone a wonderful rest of the night and, and a blessed week. I will see you all for the next Fiddler's Green podcast, or if not before, uh, I will see you on, on Substack. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. Good night.